had a highly detailed secondary task list that unlaid every task they needed to complete by the end of Flex Friday in order to have a polished product, including the amount of hours I would need for each task and what days I would work on each task. Additionally, I made a task list that would detail every task that had to be completed in order to tie together all of the work I had already done. This shortened task list was the one I ended up using since I ran into more issues with the 3D printer combined parts that I had already modeled, which, to my dismay, caused me to abandon the idea of a polished product. For the most part, I only worked on my project during Flex Friday hours, although I did work on it for homework as the deadline for Flex Friday neared. During Flex Friday hours, I would spend my time modeling, researching, or editing a part while I waited for other parts I could print. At the end of the day, I uploaded my files to GitHub and then would write a description of what I had done and the issues I had in my running journal. This project has improved my time management skills greatly by forcing me to continuously reevaluate the amount of time I would need to allocate in order to complete my tasks. I have a tendency to overestimate or underestimate the amount of time my, my task will take to complete, and this project has improved my time management skills greatly by challenging me to learn better techniques for providing an adequate amount of time to complete tasks. For instance, although I did I build a days of makeup time for every one of my task lists, it was inevitably not enough. Throughout this year, I've learned that for every task I need to complete, I must allocate roughly 20% of its estimated time for a catch-up period. I've also observed over the course of this project, I tend to get stuck on tasks I'm having trouble completing. So to solve this issue, I've learned to switch tasks if it appears I'm not making progress. Hindsight being 2020, if I could do this project all over again, I would have planned out the configuration of my parts and the method used to 3D print them before even I'm starting to model them to save myself the time and hassle of remodeling them twice. However, if I had, I would not have learned as much as I did about designing parts for 3D printing or the nuances of part configurations. Thus, the only thing I wish I had done differently is given myself more time by working on it extensively outside of Flex Friday. Eventually, I aim to develop a personal functional personal aviation vehicle that allows personal flight in a way that is practical, efficient, and environmentally friendly. Personal aviation will lower commuting time, is, are, inventally, are environmentally sustainable, and will decrease traffic congestion by expanding network capacity and moving traffic away from the constraints, constraints of infrastructure. Alternative transportation is becoming a necessity as traffic congestion increases and impacts commuting time, urban welfare, and climate change. Furthermore, Automobiles generate noise pollution, require land and infrastructure, and emit greenhouse gases that impede the quality of life in urban areas. I'm many years off from developing a full-size personal aerial vehicle capable of lifting a person. So in the short term, my plan is to continue the design and manufacture of my motion mechanism for my personal av aviation vehicle and to be able to refine it over time. After that, I will experiment with the lift production of my prototype uh, and modify the lift mechanism accordingly until I am satisfied with the results. Only then will I even begin to consider the design of a full-size version capable of lifting a person. I would like to offer my special thanks to my Flex Friday mentor, Eric Kawamoto, for his support and for his willingness to provide me with additional resources when I needed it most. Additionally, I would like to thank John Amory for teaching me about SolidWorks techniques, including the design configurations in SolidWorks. Any questions? So if you step over there, I'll, I'll have you can take whatever you want with you. Thank you. Evan, super impressive. Audience, do you have any questions? We have about two minutes for questions. Uh, two things. First of all, congratulations and thank you for putting up your failures on the screen because I think we learned so much more from that uh, that we do for just a one shot success. Um, but in the big picture, do you have any idea what type of personal flight vehicle, how they will be fueled? Oh, let me ask for that. So the question from the audience was, how does Evan think the personal flight vehicle would be fueled? So there are a couple of methods for doing this. Um, typically, uh, it has to be electric in some way. However, it can be powered by an alternative fuel that then is converted into electricity, like hydrogen. Um, stuff like that, um, but it can't run on like your typical diesel or whatever, um, because it's too, it has to be small and lightweight. Um, so I was, yeah, usually electric. Um, 
there are car manufacturers actually making personal aerial vehicles and they all use electric, so. Thank you, everybody. Um, one question real quick. Uh, what gave you the idea to like, use a hummingbird? What gave Evan the idea to use a hummingbird wing as his design? So hummingbirds actually are reasonably amazing animals um, because unlike most birds, they actually can hover in place and fly backwards um, due to the way they fly, which is to move their wings in a hummingbird like figure eight motion, uh, similar to a dragonfly. So they're actually more like insects than birds. Um, but in this way, they're really stable um, and also are far more maneuverable. So you don't require really massive wings in order to lift something heavier than they are. Um, so they have like really stubby wings, which if you scale it up, means that they're a manageable size. That's so interesting. Okay, round of applause. Thank you very much. Okay. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so you can take whatever you need. Um, for those of you in the Zoom audience, you will be receiving a link uh, chat to give a little bit of feedback to Evan. For those of you who are here in the live audience, there's a QR code if you have your phone and you're able to Fill that out while we set up for our next presenter. That would be great. Jacob, come on up. Okay, so Jacob, you're the next presenter. Okay, and your presentation is 15 minutes. You weren't here when I gave the instructions, but when there's five yeah, minutes left, when, when there's five minutes left, I'm gonna flag you, and, and you wanna be really mindful of that because we're gonna stick to it because we're running late. Okay, so I will share the screen. Sure, no, that's perfect. That's perfect, a lot of kids have been doing that. And, um, why is it not showing? What happened to this? Amos, I might need your help. Um, I might just be nearly cracking under pressure, but I don't see why. Why isn't my um like internet coming up? Um. Oh, my tabs got closed. Okay. Um, all my tabs got closed, so you have a second. <laughs> oh, no. But that's an example of just how I would just write, like how I get my writing in. And then that leads us into the next part, which is facing barriers. Because as we know, the last year, pretty weird. And it, and it really, stops me like a like a brick wall i would say and it and it didn't help that it was also my senior year which which means college and making sure everything's done so it's like yay college and it and one of the big things is is that i lost motivation in in writing these characters which was a big part of just of just how it kind of slowed down and it took me a while to really get back up and get that motivation back but 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 it was a moment of growth to bring that environment of writing wherever i went and to bring these characters to life to kind of finish the story that is what motivated me to continue onward and to bring it to where it is today and then and then uh, computer difficulty there we go so now i shall do a short reading from the book from another computer so oh yes oh, yeah, zoom call. don't don't worry you're not being left out i still know you're here so, but, but this is from earlier in the book, so it so it's not like a show of where my writing is now, but it but the kind of give a little bit of taste about what the, about what this book is about. So, without further ado, 
can't tell I'm nervous, but so. This a little bit, so I just got. Alrighty, so Jack sits down, opening the engineering book. Now to find out how that robot was made, Jack thinks, turning to pages, skimming them, through, looking through every word, going from gears to gizmos. His eyes give in and out of darkness. Maybe a few minutes won't hurt, he thinks, as he lays his head on the table, and closes his eyes. But when he opens them again, he is somewhere different. He looks around, seeing fires everywhere, with rubble littered all over the sky, a bright red with dark clouds over in the distance. He looks, oh, he looks around and sees a city all destroyed and torn down. Isn't it beautiful? Jack spun around, bracing himself to fight only to see a hooded man clothed in, in black step towards him. This isn't the word I would use this for, Jack responded, looking at the hooded man cautiously, moving closer inch by inch. Oh yeah, I forgot to say, this has some swears in it. Okay, <laughs> profanity. <laughs> Who the hell are you? The real question you should be asking yourself is where are you? The hood man answers, pointing below Jack. Jack notices. Jack follows where he's pointing, and with caution looks down and to see a sign with something written in on it. He moves closer to see it clear, only for it to say it's online academy. This isn't true. You're here right now, stand the rubble of your school, aren't you? The man asks, then shrugs. If you ask me, I say good riddance to what happened. I mean, they really did have this coming. Jack lunges at him, shout, shouting. Oh, no, that was shouting. No. Gotta get my ass checked. The man with shooting the man with icy blasts, hitting the man directly. Jack relaxes, thinking he got he got him, the hood, hood man. But as the dust settles, he can see the hood man wasn't faced at all, nor scratch or even moved him impossible, bless you. You just don't have any idea what's possible, the hood man says, smiling. How did this happen, Jack asks, looking at the devastation around them. This happened because when I gave the world an option of a better way of living, they refused, scared of the change it could bring. The hood man responded, walk, walking closer to Jack, well, sometimes people like sticking to the old and not accepting new. And sometimes I gotta agree with them, Jack. Jack says, think about it, Jack. You and your heart want to get rid of these insults, these closed mind people who keep you and your sister down on the ground where you believe you belong. The hood man says, now stopping to pick up a flower decaying on the ground. Sometimes you just gotta stop to smell the roses. And so that was, a little short reading. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. So hopefully this doesn't take two minutes. Okay. Move you around. Hi, Zoom. So how I feel about this project as a whole. So from start to finish, I am really proud of how far it's come and what I've been able to accomplish as it's a 210 page book. So it it really did come out very well. And, you know, obviously some things I would change, you know, probably, you know, gain that motivation back sooner so I could continue bring it with me. But, but I feel like from the different situations I've encountered from ones that came close to home to some that were just out of my control, I feel that I did the best I could in that, in that circumstance. So looking ahead, I'm going to go for a creative writing degree as I want to pursue pursue this more as it's just really my passion. I love I love doing what I do. And then so thanks to acknowledgement. So thank yous are in order for my friends Nora and Jonah. They're 
They're right there. They helped me from start to finish with peer reviewing it. Couldn't have gone further. And then my cluster coach, Rebecca, who, who really just helps bring my passion for writing and give me more confidence in it. And then my advisor, who's in this, who's some of them are in the Zoom call, you know, waving hi, my advisor. And the, and they really helped help support me through the ups and downs of this book. And I couldn't thank all of them enough, enough for it. So yeah, questions? Thank you so much, JP. That's so impressive. I loved how you shared the, the process too, the process and the reality of the struggle. Um, I am sorry, we do not have time for questions. Um, so we are going to go to our next presentation. For those of you in the live audience, you can give some um, feedback while we set up the next presenter. And those of you in the Zoom audience, you have a link uh, to provide some feedback for Jacob. We would really appreciate that, especially since we weren't able to ask him questions. So, Will, Will, you are up. There you are, Will. Okay, I'll, I'll get your, I'll share the screen and get your. Oops, escape there. Okay, I'm happy to introduce you to Will Secord, who did a project on artificial intelligence. Take it away, Will. I'll put this in present mode once it's, here you go. And Will, you have a, a 15 minute presentation and we'll let you know when there's five minutes. Oh, right. Okay, so uh, my name is Will Secord and I am in class of 2022, although it doesn't say that there. And I did a project on image classification and uh, neural networks, which I will explain throughout the slideshow. So initially, uh, my main idea and goals, I started right off with this, were to create an image recognition program that was able to identify 15 household items. This is things like uh, staplers, pens, pencils, etc. cetera. Uh, I, I also had the idea for um, having something like text support so you could uh, text the program your picture that you wanted to identify and then it would respond with the identified or what it identified it as um, and my final goal was my really big one which is learn more about machine learning as a whole ah. so some of the roadblocks and workarounds I encountered um, well the first roadblock of course was uh, data set sizes I needed a lot of images to train the uh, machine learning algorithm on. And data sets are massive, and I was thinking of doing one myself. And I learned that that is really hard for 15 objects. Um, for reference, I used, uh, in my final project, one that had 25,000 images total, uh, which is a lot. So um, 15 images was way too much, or 15 objects was way too much. Any tech support, I think there was some networking stuff that just didn't end up working out. And to work around these, I uh, just scrapped the tech support thing, but I uh, found a pre-made data set that worked really well. So, and that had two objects, a cat and a dog, which are not really objects, but in this case. So this is a quick rundown of the four main steps it used. Um, the first thing it does is it resizes all of the images within the data set to a certain size. Um, so it's easier to uh, manage them and it can run quicker and things like that. Uh, it also, it then um, defines the training data. So it kind of turns those images into a bunch of numbers that the computer can read easier and adds those to like a sort of like a long list of just stuff. It then uses that list to um, train the model and it creates layers, which are sort of um, parameters and uh, what, yeah, I guess parameters is probably the best way to use it, say. So it, it's sort of parameters for how it, uh, how it works and how it trains the model. And then finally, the model can be used to classify any image that, or any image uh, within the, the set um, 
that, or it's used to classify those images that, uh, an image that it gives you, sort of. So this is a quick rundown of the um, first step, of the resizing step. The first thing it does is it gets the directory of the data set, which in this case was in the same folder. So that was pretty simple. It then uh, sets an image size goal to what it resizes the images down to. And then it will um, continuously look through uh, the cat and the dog folder within the data set folder and um, look through all the images in there and resize all of the images in there and then save them to a different folder as to not mess anything up um, in between there. Cool. Um, it then, uh, the finding the training data, it's, there's some code on the right. Those are for all four of the steps. I may explain them, I may not, who knows. Um, so it gets the directory of the um, new resized images and then turns those into grayscale. Grayscale is much easier for um, neural networks and uh, image classifiers to train off of because that way there's no um, color mixed in. So if there's like, a, if you train a model off of just black dogs and then you feed it a golden retriever, it's not gonna know that's a dog. Um, it then adds them to the training data and then exports the data in a um, file format called dot pickle. If you think pickling a cucumber, it's the same kind of thing. It's just a way to save it. Uh, for training the model, it imports the training data and then it uses, um, or it defines the amount and size of the layers. As I said, this is kind of how it trains and those steps it goes through. Um, I found two, uh, two dense layers, 128 layer sizes and one convolutional layer. So those are very complicated and it's way too long for me to explain. Um, but I found those parameters to be the best after uh, a lot of trial and error finding what the best uh, combination was that seemed to get the best results. So I went with that. Um, it then creates those based on the parameters given at the beginning. It sets the parameters of those layers themselves and then initiates the training process. Once it's done trained, it'll save the model as a CNN2.model, CNN being a convolutional neural network, which is a really long phrase, but uh, I, didn't, I don't think I used it a ton here. It's, in, it's easier to say image classifier. So for actually using the model to, um, to classify like a dog or a cat, um, it, you first like set up the categories. So in this case, the two categories are cat and dog. It then um, prepares the input image. And by that, I mean, uh, does the same thing it did at the beginning with resizing it and turning it to grayscale. It then loads in the model and then makes this prediction based on uh, the model given and the input image. And here is some of what the, uh, here's some screenshots from the runtime, I guess, where uh, the, the beginning image is, um, obviously it says resize.py, that is um, resizing it. And you can see it, the, there's different like loading bars. The first one is for, I believe, uh, dogs. And the second one is cats or some, it's one of the two. Uh, I know that. So the uh, training the model looked exact, or not training, Adding it to the training data looked exactly the same, so I didn't include a screenshot for that. But the second image, which looks really strange, is the actually training it. And this kind of uh, loops through all of the image, in this case, 10 times as epoch 10. And that uh, will loop through all of the images and uh, train off that image one at a time. Or in this case, I think 24 at a time, which is really nice. Uh, you can see, um, I think in the middle where it says accuracy, in the middle kind of column thing, that's how accurate it thinks it can make an, a prediction. So at the beginning, it starts out at 0 0.6 and it ends at a 0 0.9387, which is really good. And at the end, that's the input image, what it thinks it is, and then the input image and what it, uh, yeah, so dog and cat pretty much. That's just my only proof I have of it working. If I had the images of the dog and the cat, I would show them, but um, I don't. So there's a lot that I learned from this um, project specifically. Uh, the main one being obviously experience. That was one of my main goals. Uh, I gained a lot of experience with uh, machine learning and um, image classification, as well as just Python experience, which is always nice, as well as uh, version control through something known as GitHub, 
It allows me to upload my files um, to access them later or look back at uh, and see like the progress throughout the whole thing. Uh, and like I said before, machine learning knowledge, that was really helpful and more ways to utilize Python. I used uh, a lot of new things that I normally wouldn't, which allowed me to expand my horizons with Python. And I think that's it. I would like to give a special thanks. Uh, I didn't have this here, but I would love to give a special thanks to Eric Kawamoto for helping me troubleshoot a bit, as well as uh, Pam for being my Flex Friday sponsor and keeping me focused throughout the day. So, yes. Um, if there are any questions, I can take those. Does anyone have any questions? You can step aside. I'll, I'll yeah. Any questions from the audience? Okay. So how long does it take to do two rows So the question from the audience was, how long does it take to loop through those 12,000 images yeah. for your model? So it, it does depend. I used a pretty small batch size being 24, so it did. And I think a lot of uh, epochs for my uh, actual testing. So that it, it, I think that one it took 45 minutes, but I think I ran a very quick one to get the screenshots, which was like 15 minutes. I have a question. Oh, sorry, Rebecca. So there's a lot of um, ethical implications of facial identification yes. using artificial intelligence. I was, and then when you said the thing about recognizing certain dogs versus others, I was wondering if you learned anything about that, Will, during your project. Yeah, I did. Um, I learned a lot about uh, a, a huge thing is uh, people saying that um, you know, facial recognition can be uh, racist or biased towards specific facial structures and things like that, um, which it can very much be true and usually is. Uh, I found it comes down to the uh, data set that's given to it uh, instead of the actual program itself. So um, usually that's whatever, whoever is training that model is usually uh, has either a biased data set or created that bias. Yeah. Yeah. We have time for one more question from the audience. Pam. Um, I was wondering if you gave it an image of neither a cat or dog. Oh, yeah. Pam asked, what would happen if he gave it an image of neither a cat nor a dog? So I didn't think about this until about two days ago. <laughs> so that is not in there. Um, I didn't but think about it until just now. <laughs> yeah, I, I do not know how to implement that, and uh, I haven't done that. But I think that's uh, something I'm willing to look into, and this may turn into next year's Flex Rider project as well. Oh. So there's a lot more I can do with this. Great. Round of applause. Thank you. All right, so again, please provide Will with some feedback um, using the link in the chat, and those in the room can use the QR code uh, right there. Our next presenter is Gabrielle, and I will help get you set up. Okay, I'm happy to introduce Gabby. She's going to talk to us about her work building a greenhouse. Gabby's presentation is 10 minutes long. At the end of Gabby's presentation, that marks the end of the 8.30 to 9.30 block. You might have some people dinging in and out, but don't worry about that. Um, you're, of course, welcome to stay for the whole thing. Our live audience is here for two full hours, so you, you are in left live audience. Thanks, Gabby. Hey, good morning, everybody. <laughs> when I decided I wanted to build a greenhouse for my Flex Friday project, my goal was to use it for growing vegetables and herbs for my family and pets. My biggest obstacle, however, was that I didn't know how to build or how to garden, making this a project of equal parts learning and doing. In the fall, I knew there was lots of research ahead of me, so I chose to not build my greenhouse until the spring. I spent about seven months looking at greenhouse designs, researching how they work, and documenting plant care information before I made progress on the physical structure. I made a detailed spreadsheet with plant care instructions on all the seeds I have. I researched seed depth when planting, the number of days, 
I didn't share the screen with the Zoom audience. Oh, no. I'm super bad. Sorry about that. Sorry, Zoom audience. Um, I thought I did. Okay, my bad. Okay. <laughs> um, just to go back. Okay, it won't go back. <laughs> so I made a detailed spreadsheet with plant care instructions on all the seeds I have. I researched seed depth when planting, the number of days to maturity, when to transfer the plant outside, how far the plants and seeds need to be apart, and how much I should water them. Some seeds I have, some seeds I have are carrots, tomatoes, peppers, corn, pea pods, lettuce, and a large variety of flowers. My plans for building the greenhouse changed almost weekly because I wasn't sure what to do. I had seen multiple designs with varying materials and even read a blog of how someone else built a greenhouse from scratch. It took time to decide, but finally, at the beginning of April, I came up with the idea to use the frame of a portable garage and buy greenhouse plastic separately. I'd hoped to build my greenhouse over April vacation, but when I ordered the frame, I knew it wouldn't be delivered in time to fit my schedule. So I brainstormed a new plan with the help of my parents. I upcycled an old wooden playhouse that had been in the woods near my house for years. And instead of greenhouse plastic, my dad was able to get a large roll of drop cloth plastic that works just as well. I cleaned and renovated the structure a bit before taking it into my dad's garage to staple gun the plastic. I spent most of April break working on my greenhouse and I love how it turned out. Although I'm proud of my greenhouse and the work I put into it, I can't help but feel a little disappointed in the size. I'd really wanted a big walk-in structure and not an old children's playhouse, but I appreciate what I have because it's still a greenhouse. I think my most exciting success was keeping plants alive throughout the winter. I planted pepper seeds and lettuce from store-bought vegetables and grew them in my living room window for the past six months. Those along with some flowers were planted outside a couple weeks ago. The biggest challenge I faced, as previously mentioned, was having to adapt to building with a smaller frame. I didn't expect to use the materials that I did, but I really love how my greenhouse turned out. Something I learned about myself throughout this project is that I prefer to work alone, but I do enjoy problem solving with other people as well. I also learned how to communicate my ideas more clearly by giving visuals and explanations of my thought process. Because I didn't get to build the greenhouse I originally wanted, that will be my summer project. I have not yet received the frame I ordered in April, but when it arrives, I plan to buy actual greenhouse plastic and construct a walk-in greenhouse. Some very valuable knowledge that I'm thankful to have learned through this project is so much about gardening. I found such a large amount of plant care information, information with my research, and I'm very glad to have it all documented. This can't possibly begin to wrap up such a fantastic year, but thank you to my Flix Friday advisors, Julia and Katya, for supporting me through my self-doubts. And a huge thank you to my parents as well. Shout out to my dad for helping me build the greenhouse. And to my mom for taking progress pictures. I really appreciate all the supportive energy from everyone. I'd also like to take a second to appreciate myself. I put in a lot of hard work and effort this year and I'm really proud of what I accomplished. And also, thank you everybody. <laughs> Okay. The question from the audience is what plants worked best from the greenhouse in the greenhouse? That is a good question. I didn't plant a ton of things in the greenhouse because I tried, but I still don't have a green thumb. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it didn't work too well, but um, peppers worked, lettuce. I also um, took some like clover just from my lawn. That works uh, well in my greenhouse too. I didn't plant much else. I have chives, so those work well. That's about it. Any other questions from the audience? Or Emily, if you see any from the Zoom audience. Yeah, talk to me.
Yeah, that's important. I'm going to share that with the Zoom audience. Katya mentioned that Gabby was very resilient and adaptable because there are a lot of roadblocks um, that she confronted and overcame. Um, and that was a real uh, virtue that she demonstrated. Thanks. Mm. Rebecca's asking, what inspired Gabby to undertake this big project? Okay, this is another shout out to my mom. She wanted me to put it in the slideshow, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> I started composting last year. Um, and it's kind of like an end of the year project for my last year's Flex Friday. So I used the compost to kind of put it in the soil for my greenhouse. And it was just an idea I had uh, last summer. I just wanted to build a greenhouse. I thought it would be really cool. Cool. Thank you, Gabby. Round of applause for Gabby. Okay, so do um, give some feedback, please, to Gabby. Uh, we are going to keep rolling right into our next presentation. I know that for the Zoom audience, you signed up for one hour blocks, but our live audience is here for two. Um, so our next presenter is Kaden, and you can be filling out the form for Gabby while I help to get Kaden uh, set up here. presentation is 10 minutes. Thanks. Take it away. So I built a dining room table. Um, the reason why I built this was uh, mostly because my parents wanted a new one. Um, <laughs> but uh, our old one, we had to have an extra chair to uh, for my little brother to sit on the corner and uh, the finish on it was wearing off and chipping so it didn't look that um, good so oh so yeah i made the bench there which is right here and the table i first worked on the table and i uh, was able to finish and get the bench in too so this is uh, on the right is um, what I started out with. It's just really rough uh, walnut um, lumber. We did for the top use um, figured walnut, which uh, makes it have like a ripple effect in it just with the way of the grain. And on the left, that is the whole table all um, glued up in, in rough, rough shape still. Shoot, how do I go back? Oh, there it goes. Um, so things that went well, um, things that went well is, uh, I like the uh, joints that I did. Uh, it's called a castle joint. Um, the reason why is because you can see from on the right, the leg, I have to put it through the uh, table saw to get a uh, wide enough um, gap that the boards just kind of slide in like a lot of uh, log cabin almost, um, but the actual legs is when it's just by itself looks like a castle. So yeah, you could see there the um, shape that I had to make it, and that was all done on the table saw as well. Um, that took a while of a lot of cutting because I just had to do it like an eighth of an inch at a time, and. You can kind of see down at the right, um, the castle joint uh, coming together there. One of the problems I actually did run into, you can see here, is normally that there's not the, um, the aprons are like four inches where like that go into the legs, but uh, the blades only go up like three inches, at least this one that I had. So I had to make an extra um, little cutout piece um, there to actually make it work on the table saw instead of doing it by hand and making the joints not look as well because I'm not good at that. Um, for how the top was glued together, you can see that there's a like a slot in it where I put um, MDF to kind of form them and make them flat towards each other because I didn't want them to um, 
glue together and be off, then the table would just get thinner and thinner. So uh, what is next for me? I am going to be going to the um, University of Maine at Augusta to become a commercial pilot. But I will also be continuing working on um, in the workshop building things. Um, so just some of the things I've built over the past couple of years. Um, yeah, my past two flex ride projects. So this is uh, the bench that I was working on, just a smaller, it's really just a smaller version of the actual top, I mean, on the table. And I would like to give, um, uh, to thank uh, Sunny for helping me with this project uh, and just advising me along the way. Uh, my grandfather who was uh, there um, and helping me with all of the long pieces because the table is eight feet long. So I, that was hard to hold by yourself. Uh, my dad also who helped me uh, problem solve along the way and figure out how to attach the table um, top to the actual base of it. Any questions? We have five minutes for questions. I love how this was an intergenerational thing. It's wonderful. Yep. Is there anyone in the live audience who has a question? And then I'll did then pause and I'll read it to the Zoom. Go ahead, Eric. Hi, I have a question. Did you make drawings of the floor band and plan out the work? Yes. Did the second time Okay, so the question was, did you make drawings beforehand before you made them? And how did you join the planks together to make the tabletop? Yeah, so unfortunately, I forgot to put in uh, the um, drawings uh, on the slideshow, but I actually made them in CAD. And um, as far as the uh, top going together, I took a router to the side of it, um, side of the boards, and cut out a slot and then put a piece of MDF into it to kind of join them together so if the board was warped at all it would strain out with each other and as well as gluing them pam What's MDF? pam uh, asked what is mdf uh, mdf is basically a uh, cardboard that is just compressed together into a sheet of it's not plywood, but it's the same size of plywood. It's plywood, but instead it's cardboard. Uh, the question uh, from the audience was, what's harder, making an electric guitar or a table? Was that the question? Yeah, yeah. an electric guitar or a table or a guitar? Or a table. Um, definitely a guitar with all of the electrical work. Uh, I am not good at soldering at all. So that was uh, very challenging. This was more so just a bigger scale and um, I haven't worked with this much um, space. I've, I've been more so working on boxes and pens, bowls. Oh, he has a candle holder on his table, Zoom audience. You can't see here. I should have showed you. Yeah. So this is a, a candle stick holder that I made for uh, my mom for Mother's Day. Um, and yeah, because my uh, grandfather made one for my grandmother and my mom loved it so much that she was like, after you build the table, you have to make one. Wow. So secretly, while I was working on another project, I made this and uh, we have seven people in our family. So I made it so there was a candle for each person in our family. So. That is amazing. Yeah. Wow, that's very, very talented. Thank you, Kaden. Thank you. All right, so please do provide some feedback for Caden using the uh, link in your in the chat. And our next presenter is Julia Bell. And while I set Julia up, the live audience can be giving feedback too. Hi, Julia. Hi. Let me just go like this and get. Good 
might not hit the 18 minute mark. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So do you want me to put it in present mode like that? Yeah, sure. Okay. And then I will share the screen with the Zoom audience. And I call you back to our studio, but does your project have a different name? Okay. Okay. Introduce Julia Bell, a member of the Baxter Art Studio. Julia has an 18 minute presentation. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I will try my best to keep you engaged because I have a feeling some of the people might have just woken up in here, um, which I can relate to. Um, but for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Julia. I'm class of 2023, so I'm a sophomore. Um, and my cluster coach is Gretchen Yock. So, oh my God. Okay, what exactly is my project? So I'm in the Baxter Art Studio um, and my task was to create three projects um, that are all kind of related to art in some way. Um, so my first project, I chose to create a small portfolio and that portfolio was gonna be submitted into the uh, Scholastic Art Awards. Um, and then for my second project, I decided to create a song composition um, along with like a music video. And then for my third, I decided to kind of start teaching myself the fundamentals of oil painting. Um, so project one, uh, before I go really into depth about what the project is, um, I'll explain a little bit about the Scholastic Art Awards. Um, so for those of you who don't know, uh, it's Classic Art Awards is like an annual um, award ceremony that gives recognition to artists around the country. Um, and so it's like a wide variety of different ages and different grades. And there's just like really incredible artwork that's submitted by um, the youth. Um, and so you can receive a gold key, which is the highest, a silver key, second highest, and then honorable mention. Um, and so first when you submit it, it goes to regionals. And then if you get a gold key in the regionals, then you can go to um, nationals and they judge you there. And there's some like pretty big rewards there. I think there's like lots of scholarships. And um, I think a couple of years ago, Tina Fey was like hosting um, one of the award ceremonies in New York City. Um, so it's a pretty big deal. But so what exactly was I going to submit? Um, so for a long time, I had always been, uh, I always wanted like to study how humans um, feel grief and how how psychologically that affects somebody. Um, and so I really wanted to portray that in my art in some way. And so it took a lot of thinking, um, but I ultimately decided with the idea of creating a white silhouette. Um, I chose to do a white silhouette over just like a black silhouette because black kind of represents a void while the white silhouette represents the memories that are still there. It felt more hopeful. Um, and so here we have just a little a little draft kind of idea of what I was doing. You just got like a couple here and kind of the, the woman on the right is the, the white silhouette. Um, so what was the final product? Um, this is my art portfolio. It's only got four pieces in it, but um, I named it the missing piece of the puzzle. And I don't usually like to explain the meaning because I love to have people be able to figure out, interpret it themselves because I really love people like interpreting art and things like that. Um, so I think a couple of these are really self-explanatory, but I feel like you can take them in more ways than they're portrayed, which I find really interesting. Um, so I could not submit, however, my whole portfolio until I was a senior. Um, so I really only got to submit this one piece. I had to choose from my portfolio. Um, and so I decided to submit this piece um, it's titled You're Still Here. Um, it was actually inspired by my grandparents. Um, so there's, there's that. Um, and I was actually really grateful to find out that it had gotten a gold key in the regionals. Um, it didn't make it to the national. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it didn't make it to the nationals, which I'm totally fine with. But we have had, like, I think there is a student um, from Baxter that did get, like, a gold key in national, which is really incredible. Um, and if you do want to like check out some of the artwork by um, some of the Baxter students, they have um, all the regional awards are on the Mecca website. So some of the work that students did here, I was really impressed by it. Um, so it's just amazing. Um, and then how did I stay on task? So 
my main strategy for staying on task was basically having no strategy at all. Because as an artist, it's really hard to make a to-do list and just do your thing. You kind of have to wait for your inspiration or else you can end up in what's called an art block, which kind of just means you have absolutely no motivation at all to do any art. Um, and I found that happened a lot, especially during this whole COVID thing. I had no inspiration, just didn't feel like doing art at all. Um, and so I just decided to make no schedule and I found that was the best for me because that's how I got all my work done on my own schedule. And it actually, it turned out fine. I met all the deadlines, so, um, so yeah. All right, now my project two is expanding the connection between film and music. So movies and their soundtracks. Um, so for my second project, I really had a hard time choosing between doing film or uh, music, because those are two things that I'm really passionate about. Um, but I feel like both of them kind of fall in the category of art. So that's why it's kind of part of this project. Um, and so I decided to actually combine them into one big project. So the main goal of this is to create my own song um, and then create a music video to go alongside it, because I've kind of been um, doing a lot of music recently. And so I haven't really, and I've kind of been doing film separately, but I just kind of wanted to combine those a little bit. Um, yeah. So the inspiration. Um, so for a long time, I've been really inspired by movie soundtracks. And right on the right, you have four examples of my favorite movies. Each of them have a beautiful soundtrack with amazing composers, um, specifically Interstellar. Um, Hans Zimmer is the composer. He's incredible. Um, and so what I wanted to do was kind of get inspiration from these composers and incorporate it into my own work. Um, so I did spend a lot of time watching films and movies and noticing and listening to their soundtracks and kind of noticing how these soundtracks kind of help portray the emotions in the film, when the type of music is, is used in the film, and all that. So I spent a lot of time just doing a lot of studying. Um, so the process uh, for the next couple of weeks, spent a lot of time, so like I said, just studying the soundtracks and all that. Um, I also looked at some of like the scores and like noticing how the chord progressions worked out and what notes they were using. Um, and so that's a photo of me at my, it's kind of hard to see, but it's me at my piano at uh, like two in the morning. <laughs> so it's really dark, but I had, this is actually an example of random inspiration. I was sitting in my bed and then I was just like, I have this idea of this chord progression. So I went downstairs and to my family member's dismay, <laughs> I had to like, I had to write this down and kind of hear what it sounded like on the piano. Um, and so the more I listened to these pieces, I kind of understood the patterns, kind of how they created this emotional effect with what chords they were using, because we all know that music is kind of the biggest thing. Um, and, and movies, like, you, it's hard to have a really emotional movie without the music in it. It really helps escalate that emotion. Um, and so I took this creation, this 2 a.m. creation, and decided to incorporate it into my, um, my music software. <laughs> So this is Ableton. It looks a little bit confusing, but I promise you it's not as confusing as it looks. Um, so basically I just kind of incorporated this. I don't have my own orchestra. Um, sadly, I'm not, I'm not connected with any orchestras. Um, and so I had to kind of create my own um, composition with digital strings and digital um, plugins and things like those. Um, so it was a little bit expensive because sometimes paying for a digital orchestra can be hundreds of dollars. Um, so I had to kind of find cheaper alternatives to that. Um, and so after a lot of hard work, I finally titled this Sleeping Canyon. Um, and the reason it's called that is because it's to kind of commemorate my time to um, when I was in Sedona, Arizona. Um, so just kind of, I felt like really, it was a really spiritual experience and I wanted to incorporate that into my music and, and all that. So, okay. So this is the deliverable. Um, for the past year, I have been doing a lot of videography. Um, a lot of it is travel videography. Some of it is for weddings. Some of it is for senior, senior photo shoots. Um, and so what I did is I kind of just put all these clips together and let's see, these are like some of my favorite clips. 
and kind of, I thought that they kind of fit with the mood of Sleeping Canyon. Um, so this is only a minute long. Sleeping Canyon, the composition itself is about like eight minutes long. So it's a bit longer, but um, I will show you this. Hopefully it's not too laggy for you guys on Zoom. Sounds okay. Oh wait, how do I turn the sound up? Oh, here we go, I got it. now I'm currently in the process of working on a whole album kind of with songs similar to that kind of the orchestra type um, type music um, it's taken about six months so far so it's a really long process each song takes about three or four days um, and a lot of planning beforehand so Sleeping Canyon is definitely one of my favorite um, songs um, if you'd like a full version I can probably send you um, if you're if you're listening to the whole thing um, but yeah, basically that's just my second project for you. Um, so what went well? Um, I think spending a lot of time kind of pulling apart music and listening to it more really helped me understand music theory because I was never taught music theory. Um, I took piano lessons for one year, but it never really made any sense to me. So I decided to just go off and do my own composition work. Um, and so just listening, kind of figuring out um, over the course of quarantine, I've kind of taught myself every chord on the piano and kind of how they work together. Um, and so I found that was a lot easier than just opening up a sheet music book and kind of learning from there. Um, I'm still not great at sheet music. I probably won't ever be. <laughs> um, but yeah, so one of my biggest setbacks um, was that I experienced a lot of lack of motivation. Um, I, I think a lot of people in their Flex Fridays experience that. Um, but it's really difficult just to sit at a piano and just make something. You have to, you have to spend a lot of time getting that inspiration. Um, and I found that a lot of the time I would be repeating some of the chords I was doing and my songs sounded really similar. Um, so for a while I got really frustrated because I couldn't make anything original. Um, and so I just, I found the way to overcome that was, like I said, just looking at films and understanding how they did their compositions and they made these beautiful chord progressions that I didn't even think about. Um, so yeah. And then this is my final project, uh, which is oil painting. Okay. Um, so oil painting has been something I really wanted to try. These are not mine. I wish they were. Um, but these are two of my biggest inspirations. The one on the left, uh, the one on the right is Mark Tennant. And the one on the left is Kat Grafton, which is actually, they're like actually from Portland, Maine, which is really interesting. Um, but they're really well known um, on Instagram and all that. So yeah, um, so starting out, I had a lot of difficulty um, with oil paints, uh, specifically because they never looked like those artists I was inspired by. Um, and I got really frustrated by that because it never came out the way I wanted it to. 
Um, and there was also a bunch of like chemicals and like a bunch of solvents and things that I needed to buy. And I went to an art store and a, a woman was like, yeah, this is explosive. And I was like, oh, okay. So I obviously had a hard time working with explosive materials. Um, so that I had to watch a lot of videos and I had to talk to people at art stores to get all that set. Um, so I decided to spend a lot of time before I went into oil painting, doing a lot of sketches and studying anatomy and things like that. Um, so that it would be more easy to actually go into the oil painting. Um, so for a long time, actually a few weeks, I spent a lot, a lot of time watching YouTube videos about shading and, and value and anatomy of the hand. That's my hand right there, three of them. Um, but yeah, I just kind of studied that a lot. Um, and then, so these were the deliverables, which were actually two of these, they're both um, assignments from my drawing one class. Um, the right, one on the right was actually a chiaroscuro assignment, and then the one on the left was a mixed media assignment. Um, and so I was, pretty, I was pretty happy with these, but I kept using grayscale and black and white images, black and white paint, so it wasn't, because I'm not like great at color theory, so it was difficult to like make stuff in color. Um, so reflection, um, even though I didn't end up painting as many portraits than I initially planned, uh, I believe that I learned a lot more, which is important, and hopefully in the future I will have knowledge, take my oil art even further, um, learn about color theory more, because I, I think that's the thing I neglected in my art knowledge. Um, I'm just going to spend a lot more time teaching myself the fundamentals. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you to Matt Barnes for helping me with my <laughs> classic submission. Um, Thank you to Gretchen Yock, who I don't think is here. Oh, hi, Gretchen. Um, and then everybody else who gave me moral support. So thank you, guys. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, thank you. We really have time for one question. And I'm going to ask the student with the peach colored mask. Each of the pieces took, okay, the question was how long did each of the piece in the portfolio take yes uh it's kind of similar to the music each of the pieces took about four to five days some might have been even longer especially the year still here portrait that took a long time there's a lot of shading and and even though it's digital art it should be taking like a shorter time it took me a long time to just get the anatomy right and do all that stuff but yeah mm -hmm. other than that it was a pretty pretty quick process i think four to five days is quick for me. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys. Okay. So you know the drill, you can use the QR code if you're in the live audience to give some feedback. That would be really appreciated to do that feedback form. You can use your phone with that QR code. If you're in the Zoom room, there's a link in the chat for you to provide some feedback. Well, I hope to set up our next presenters, Sam and Cam Woodworking. So gentlemen. Yes, thank you. Take it away, Sam. Thank you. Uh, hi. So, I uh, think yeah, I think we can see it. So, uh, my name is Cam, and I'm Sam. And uh, so, this is our project. Oh. 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 Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh. So this year, uh, we made some products that range from things such as a, a cutting board, which isn't here, but uh, a DVD stand over there and uh, also a cornhole set. We only have half of it, but the other half's at our house. Um, 
Uh, yeah, so we documented um, all of our progress and progress pictures on a website that we made, um, which we can show at the end as well, um, and also on Google Classroom, so Sonny could see what we did that day and just our process in general. Oh. oh, okay. Actually, we missed a slide. I don't think we're back. Okay, so yeah, our uh, our purpose for this project was to create uh, like a well-established and high-quality company, uh, as well as like create some uh, fully furnished uh, products that are of high standards. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we started this project just because we just wanted to create things that we're passionate about. Um, and just learn more of like, because I think that we're both interested in woodworking and everything because we've been in the fab lab um, and just learn more just, just in general and like know like what we're working with and know our individual skills, so. So uh, yeah, some of the goals that we had for this year were uh, just to kind of brainstorm and come up with like a small handful of like products that range from like different things or like like different areas of woodworking uh, to like really get a feel for uh, what we can do. And uh, just also, yeah, just have some stuff that we'd be really happy to present. As you can see, uh, this was another side project that we had done, uh, which was some shelves for Sam's family. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, um, so another part of our project, as like you saw, was like kind of like a more business approach. Uh, and to do that, we were gonna try to sell some of uh, our products online through uh, like social media, as well as like, our online store, which didn't uh, really have, it didn't really get to happen as much this year, just we because we didn't really know um, what we were like getting ourselves into. So we took this year to kind of like really and get a feel of like what we can do but this will like the more business side of it will definitely be a priority for our senior year yeah and um, another and just another goal like cam said we just wanted to just figure out like what we're good at in our strong suits and also like he doesn't really we didn't really know like extremely like a lot so and i have the privilege to have my family know that and do projects with them and stuff so He's learning as well, and we're both learning. So, like next year, um, it's going to be good because we're going to know a lot more, and we're going to narrow down our items and figure out what we want to do and sell. So, so uh, some things to note for like Wednesdays, we would uh, get together early in the morning and uh, go through kind of like how we want our day to go, and or like you know just talk. Uh, about what project like like what are we prioritizing today like what's the current project where it'd be like maybe the cornhole game and stuff like that uh what how much time we have left on our current project and then uh any materials we would need for like said project and like what we have available to us and what we need to outsource for yeah so yeah pretty much just like Cam said just before we're done working on that Wednesday, we pretty much make a list if we need anything. So that's good. That can be the first thing that we do Wednesday after. So just, yeah, organize everything a lot better. Uh, yeah, so with the with what we made this year, there wasn't really anything uh, that we weren't proud of. We all kind of liked it. Uh, we kind of liked every product that we made and we we're you know happy to show them off. Um, but I mean, we did have struggles um, just due to online learning and everything and not having a teacher near us. Um, but Sonny did text back pretty quick, so that was helpful. Um, and my dad and my brother also are a resource, so I use them as well. And we just kind of just execute after we figure out the problem and figure out a solution to it, figure out how to execute it. And yeah. Um, so what we took away from this year, well, we uh, both agreed that 
something that went really well for us was communication and uh, just being able to help each other out, uh, whether it be if Sam was working on something and he needed me to just assist him, like, you know, as small as just holding like a piece of wood for him or for me on my side, sometimes uh, I would need help just kind of like uh, making the website and like I would ask him to kind of double check things and give his feedback, which was really helpful. Yeah. Um, and like I said, just the struggles and everything, but I also what we've made or parts of it because like like with the cutting board like we want to make like a like a set like maybe with like a spoon and a spatula or something like that um sell it like that so i mean we know how to make the cutting board so i mean we we just yeah i, th I think that, that we made things and we confidently think that we can make them again or make them even better than they are so uh so what's next for us well we definitely want to continue this project for next year like we said we want to kind of like get a more business side going as well as uh just improve our skills uh so one thing we also are able to do since we do like live near each other and stuff we can um we're gonna work together this summer uh to uh, sorry, we're going to work in the summer to uh, come up with some ideas uh, of like what uh, some other products some new things we can make as well as narrow down what we want to do to uh, and, and get that going so we can have a head start for our senior year. Yeah. Uh, and just yeah be ahead of the game really. Yeah, yeah, we just want to be ahead and just try to at least make or like know what we want to make and make one of each or something like that so we can just get to instantly making them again and selling them so right. it's just selling is our main goal for next year i'd say okay. Thank you. We have two minutes for questions so if you want to step over i'll address the zoom screen and you can okay. address the live audience uh yes Work. Do you have any ideas about like, like how much your materials cost, cost how much you're paying yourself? Oh, your oh right. and I'm going to repeat that question, oh, okay. please. Um, so, you know, basically, do you have the beginnings of a business plan? Okay, so Eric's question was Do they have a good understanding of the cost of supplies and the understanding of the money they would need to start a business? Uh, yeah, we actually, I, I, sorry, I forgot to mention during our presentation, uh, we logged every receipt that we had uh, purchased for like the wood or the paint or anything like that. Uh, and we kept it all neatly filed into a Google sheet. Uh, so we can kind of look back, keep track of our spending and kind of like plan uh, for how much like each product we would want to cost and stuff like that. How much time it took Right, yeah, we, yeah, it has the dates and everything like that, so. Uh, any other questions? Yes, Emily. Was there a particular area you made a lot of pieces? Was there a particular one that gave you like the most challenge? Emily asked if there was a particular piece that gave them the most challenge. Yeah, um, I say this just because um, I literally saw a bunch of DVDs in my room one day, and I wanted to make a DVD stand, but I wanted to make something different, so I like just. Do it, did a control drawing and everything, and then through trial and error. Um, yeah, this took us a couple kind of, yeah, of different just, attempts. Yeah, so, but I mean, I think it came out pretty decent. I see it. And the, uh, Zoom audience, this is, um, can I explain what that is for them? Oh, yeah, so this is a, a cornhole game. It's a you know, pretty classic summertime game. Uh, and we obviously didn't want them to keep it like just plain and simple, so that's why we uh, came up with the design for it to just give it a bit more of extra pot and then uh yeah cool thank you so much a big round of applause thank you. okay Della is a member of the Baxter Art Studio she is decorated with awards and recognitions and we are really happy to hear your presentation Della take it away yeah I can bring it over for you oh I see that my computer's on the side all right
Okay. So I'm presenting to Zoom right now. You're presenting to Zoom and the live audience. And what we're suggesting to people is, you know, if you sit, they can see you on the Zoom screen. If you stand, they can probably see you on the Zoom screen too. Okay. Um, all right. So um, this is my Flex Friday presentation. Um, I'm in the art studio, um, which every year, usually how the art studio is set up is you do three different projects. Um, obviously this year, a little bit iffy things kind of you know take longer than you expect or take shorter than you expect and obviously um trying to do art not in the art room is always a challenge um but this is kind of a, a combination of all the art things i worked on um this year all right so yeah so the first thing um i did and kind of the biggest thing i did is i made this short film Let's see if I can get it to get it to play. I don't know. There's audio. The audio is not going to come through. That's fine. Um, but I'll just let this play. Uh, I made this animated short film. Uh, you can find if you're in person, the model that I use is for the background is right here on the table. Um, but obviously, I did not make physically. Um, the kind of outline you see there is a rotoscoped image of myself or video of myself um, that I kind of superimposed in. Uh, and this was a really fun project to try. I had made this um, model originally for other purposes. I was going to do a little miniature diorama and build more on what I have right now. Um, but after we went online, I kind of had to adapt what I was using my model for and do something that I could um, work on more from home. Um, and so I decided to work on this animation instead. Uh, let's see. Oh. Um. See if I can. Okay, we're not gonna do that. Then. Yeah, there's a like little slideshow to show um, that I made. <laughs> That's fine. We don't have to look at it. I can just talk. Um, so and it's just kind of talking through the process of making this. Um, I had started this actually last year in person at um, at Baxter in the art studio, um, and we had kind of taken it home in this mad dash in March. Um, and at the time I had been like, oh, I'll keep working on it. I'll keep making this diagram at home. Um, but then obviously um, it's, a, it's a lot harder to work on like a physical project when you need the supplies from the art room when you're not actually in the art room. Um, and so that led me to experimenting with um, the Adobe Suite and learning how to rotoscope. Um, I also played around with Adobe Audition to make the soundtrack, which you can't hear, but that's fine. Uh, and basically put all these things together into that little short film um, and then compiled that and uh, submitted it to the Scholastic Art Awards. Uh, and there are a couple other pieces uh, that I put in the Scholastic Art Awards that we'll see through this presentation. Um, but this is the one that won um, a gold medal nationally, which is nice. Um, and the Scholastic Art Awards, I'm sure you've heard of them. They're we talk about them a lot at school, um, is a national um, art competition. Um, and yeah, I submitted this one with not really any super high expectations, but it was super cool um, that other people liked it as well. Um, and it did well nationally, which is very exciting to see. All right, so I'm just gonna scroll through another couple like things just to show like the array of things you can do in the art studio. These are all um, linoleum block prints that I made um, kind of throughout the course of the year. Um, you can see the one in the middle there, um, won a gold key uh, regionally in this classic art award. And I also got an honorable mention in the um, congressional art awards, which is pretty cool. If you enter in the scholastic art awards and you have pieces that win, then they automatically go on to get judged in the con congressional art awards. Um, and you don't even have to do anything, which is nice. Uh, and then this is yet another medium. Uh, this is a short, there we go. Uh, audio mixing. 
that I kind of put together um, about cyclonophores, because I think they're really cool um, creatures. Um, these are all digital, so yet another medium, just kind of studies of people, um, just trying, these are all from, I believe they're all studies from life, except for those two on the far right. And Wash new, um, new kind of smaller uh, projects working with different mediums. Let's see. And I also work a lot on, um, on graphic design projects. Um, I'm taking, I took a graphic design class and then I also kind of worked on it in my free time, um, you know, messing around with learning how to use uh, Adobe Illustrator um, and working on the kind of design process instead of like uh, with Liminal Space where it was this like months long design process, these are much smaller process or much smaller projects. So the whole thing goes by a lot faster um, and it's a good practice. This is a cross work or uh, cross stitch um, piece that I'm working on right now. Uh, and these are some more kind of assorted, um, you know, mixed medium things that I've worked on. Um, this piece up here, I also put into the Scholastic Art Awards. Um, that's a shadow box, which I could have brought, but I didn't. Uh, project, which is the tarot deck that I made. Um, that, yeah, right there. Um, so this is another example. I just showed you all of these kind of smaller projects that I've done, but this is an example of where like the value of time from the Baxter Art Studio and also just from the past year in general has really like allowed me to do things that I never would have done otherwise. Um, and I made an entire tarot deck. I illustrated it myself. All of it is done by hand. You can see there's a little, little video of like what it looks like for me to be <laughs> making that card. Uh, so I did each of these cards by hand. Originally, it was kind of work uh, practicing inking and practicing using ProQuill uh, pens. Um, and then I kind of just kept going and kept making more cards. And eventually I decided, you know what? I've already made 10 cards. What's another 68 cards to go? <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, so I, I decided to make an entire deck, um, which was really challenging, but it was also really fun. Um, and it was, you know, like I said, if I was in a normal school or if it was a normal year, I would never, ever, ever have the time to sit down and make 78 cards in a deck. But this year I did. And with this, like the Baxter Art Studio, I had the time to do that. And then another thing that I did through the art studio is, um, I am actually producing this tech, this deck to sell. Um, I'm having it made professionally um, and printed and actually should be, it's actually should be, all the decks are being shipped to me right now, uh, which is really exciting. And I'll be selling them around Portland. And so that's kind of uh, an example of maybe the most kind of tedious long form project you could possibly do but I did it and now I am gonna sell it. And it's very exciting to kind of get my artwork into other people's hands. Um, so yeah, and that's a picture of my, a drawing of my cat. Um, so this is kind of an example of how many different things you can do. I definitely didn't cover every single possible medium. I'm missing some, I didn't do clay. I didn't really do any oil painting, but like, Basically, if you have a type of art medium that you want to do, you can do it. It's probably in this presentation somewhere, uh, and you can find a place in the art studio to do it, even when you're working um, remotely, which is obviously there are challenges that come with working remotely, especially when it comes to like a literally hands-on medium. Uh, but I still feel like this year kind of gave me opportunities that I don't think will ever happen again. Um, and I do really appreciate that. Um, and it kind of let me cover this ground from these really long drawn out projects like the tarot deck and like liminal space here uh, to smaller, more kind of concentrated 
explorations in Medium um, and kind of little projects that just let me explore and build my portfolio um, and overall just kind of work on art, which is what I wanted to do. Um, and it was really, really exciting. Um, so that is my presentation. Yes, and I'll have you stand over there and I'll okay. make the um, Thank you so much, Stella. I, I just want to show the Zoom audience because you oh, can't see it. So. Yeah, sorry. That's okay. No, no, there's a lot of wires. This is the, um, how would I describe this? Beautiful model that was prize winning for Della. It's kind of cool to see it in person. There's a lot of wires up here, people. Um, so, are there any questions for Della? Yes. So, the question was of all the different mediums that you tried, what was your favorite? Um, I still think there's a special place in my heart for uh, animation. I've done a couple little animation things, um, and it's one of it's like the tarot deck. Like, it's so it takes forever, but the outcomes can be so beautiful and so like I'm amazed by people who can animate. I definitely my animation skills are still in the baby stages, um, but it's a medium that just like inspires me to do more every time. Yeah. Okay, the question was, can you tell us a little bit about the sound design for liminal space? Yes, and I know that we couldn't really hear it here. It's fine. Um, but what, that's one of the things I worked on to kind of pull this whole um, kind of short film thing together uh, was making a little soundscape for it. Um, and so obviously this is kind of set up like a, um, like a train station at night. Um, and so what I did is I kind of gathered these different sound effects from all over the internet, like crickets, kind of noise, ambience. Um, I found this sound like a, a train station um, notification, like the doo doo, um, and I put them all together. Um, and I also wanted to do these announcements, which one of the things about Liminal Space is I wanted it to be a familiar, um, these familiar kind of motifs, but I didn't want it to be specific to any one region. Um, like I wanted you to be able to recognize that it's a train station or some sort of like, you know, train stop, but I don't want you to know where it's from. Um, so what I did for these announcements is I basically, I found this text to speech um, translator for all these different languages and I recorded them onto my phone. I think it was Russian, Swedish, Arabic, Japanese. Um, there was more. I, those are just the first few that uh, kind of came up off the top of my head. Um, and I recorded them saying these messages and then compiled them all together. Um, oh. And then I took all these separate elements and I put those all together into a soundscape and I put music in the background and messed around with Adobe Audition. Um, I haven't really done anything like that before, but it was really fun and it was a uh, kind of challenge to see. I don't, I'm not experiencing any of these things in person. How many things can I find kind of through the internet and in my life that I can put together into this one kind of audio thing. Yeah. Tyler. Um, I especially appreciate how, okay, there's time for a little, a few more questions, but I just especially appreciate you highlighting how so much of this wouldn't have been possible without COVID. The yes. depth of your work. Yes, it is kind of like trying to find a silver lining. Um, you know, obviously I, this is not how I envisioned my senior year going by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but, you know, it does, it did come with opportunities, which, you know, it's, it's a small silver lining, but I'll take it where I can get Absolutely. it. Yeah. We have time for one more question. If anybody has a question. All right. Round of applause. Thank right. you. Della. Okay, so there's a, a link in the chat for you to fill out a feedback form. If you're in the live audience, there's a piece of paper right there. You can take out your phone and use the QR code. We really, really value your feedback and we'll be able to share it with our presenters. So thank you for taking the time to do that while we set up the next.
the next pre presentation. The next presentation, you all received an email. I'm super excited for this. There's going to be a dissection, a shucking of oysters. So I did send out an email if anyone has is prone to an airborne seafood reaction. You've been forewarned. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, awesome. So our, our next present, presenter, Kimberly, if you want to come up, I'll, I'll help get you started. While Kimberly's setting up, just continue working on your feedback forms. Hello. I'm just going to share the screen and get to your slides. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that might be good because if you want to show it, I can. Yeah, turn it over. Okay, so Kimberly is going to share with us her experience as an intern at the Spartan Sea Farm. Take it away, Kimberly. If for, for the talking parts, if you can sort of be here too for the Zoom audience, because we have yeah. way more people on the Zoom. Thank you. Uh, um, so for the past few years, I've been interning with Spartan Sea Farms, Madeline Point Oysters, and pound of tea oysters um, for my Flex Friday project. Um, so these are a few pictures from of me last year. The one on the left is um, my first day out on the farm, actually, and I just uh, I think that's an oyster that I was eating. And the picture on the right is me on my first day with my bibs. <laughs> um, they are squeaky clean in that picture. And then this is me this year. We were helping some friends harvest kelp. Um, so I was holding up a lot of kelp. And then the picture on the right um, is a very, very, very cold day and very windy. And we were on a Zoom meeting and I was not having a good time. So I was hiding in my hat and my mask. Um, so I'm just kind of gonna go over like what it, what my day kind of looks like in the process of growing oysters. So on the left is the boat that we go out on. Um, there's actually two very similar boats. The one on the left um, is Madeline Point Oysters boat, and the one on the right is Spartan Sea Farms boat. Um, and then on the the right picture is kind of what a typical farm looks like. So the cages where you can kind of see like the gray on the side, those are ones that have um, oysters in them. And so the like metal part is down where the actual oysters are. And then the ones flipped up with like the metal up kind of, I don't know if you can see this cage, but so the ones that are facing like this don't have any oysters in them. That's just to mark like, uh, so you don't pull up an empty um, so when we first get oysters, they're fat. So on the left picture, that's kind of the typical size that we get them in as. I think they're like a millimeter big. Yeah, so you can see the like grid paper on the bottom. So then just grow in a little bit. And so this is how we grow them in their like infant stage. So on the left is a flepsy, and a flepsy is a floating upwelder system, and it helps grow shellfish in open water while keeping them protected. And that dock, we actually have two of them. One is um, near the muddy rudder, and the other one is um, by the Royal River Grill in Freeport. Um, and so yeah, we just have those like. Um, docks out there and then inside each compartment there's like these silos and there's a couple in each compartment and they house like thousands of little baby oysters and you can see Ken kind of cleaning them out and helping them stay clean and one really nice thing about the muddy rudder where one of our flepsies is is that there's so many nutrients um that body of water just has a lot of things to help grow the oysters. So that's a really good spot 
um, to help oysters grow a lot faster. And so once they're big enough, we um, sort them. So this is a sorter on the left, and we just take like one of the silos and we dump them onto that um, like conveyor belt, you think, and they drop down into this um, tumbler and that's kind of like jiggling like this back and forth, helping the oysters go through the machine. And then they sort them by size. So you can see on the right, the buckets of like the different oysters. And the one, the little like yellow buoys are just to mark that those have been sorted so we don't resort them. And then there's a picture of me working on um, getting the oysters to go through the tumbler. And I didn't really have a picture to go with that picture. So this is a picture of me looking like an actual marshmallow. I think I have like probably like eight layers on my top and like probably like two pairs of pants and two pairs of socks and some boots. Um, this is a regular outfit for me on the bow. I definitely go hard on the layers. Um, and even then, I'm still complaining that I'm cold. And yeah, it, it can get intense in the winter, for sure. And the masks, when they get wet from like the water splashing up, just makes your face so cold. And it just adds to the misery. But the, com <laughs> <laughs> the company is great, though. So I'm not complaining. <laughs> Um, so once they're sorted and ready to go out on the water, we put them into the cages. This is a really funny picture of us putting four cages on Ken's little Tacoma. Um, and then we, Ken and I carried all of the cages down like side by side. So we like split the weight and we carried like 10 of them down. And then on the last few, Ken was like, you want to be a turtle? And I had no idea what that meant, but I was like, sure. And so we carried them like this. And there was actually some like seventh graders or like middle schoolers um, where we were doing like a field trip thing and they were all watching us do that. And they thought it was very entertaining. Um, so yeah, once we carried them down onto the um, dock, Jess was lining up all of them. So um, we have this big long line and then two shorter lines coming off with like coffee cups kind of attached to them and then on each end of the cage there's like a little slip knot and we like widen that up and then put the hockey puck through it and then tighten it so it stays like in a straight line on the water theoretically sometimes so like storms and stuff mess it up and we have to go out and fix it um and then they get put into these bags this and so there's different sizes of like the mesh on here um and these hold anywhere from like 300 ish oysters to like 100 depending on how big they are they just open like this and then we close them up and then slide them into the cages so the cages in that picture have six little compartments for each of them but the cage i have here has four little spots And then you can slide the bag in. So, yeah. Thank you. And then in the summer, we get ready to tumble the oysters. Um, so this is what the tumbling machine looks like. It's actually on this big flow out by Cousins Island. Um, and so we dump, take the bags out of the cages and we dump them into the spot where like the conveyor belt brings them up. And we'll have like a couple people down at the end um, getting everything that's not oysters out of there, like mussels and just like seaweed and stuff that got into the bag. And then the big orange thing, we have two different size metal um, 
like cylinders inside with holes on the inside, like holes cut out. And there's like a smaller one and then a bigger one. So it depends like how big your oysters are that you're tumbling. And then that just goes like this constantly and tumbles them and sorts them by size. So the blue bucket's like one size, the gray bucket's another size, and then the one on the end is another size. And that just really helps um, grow them more uniformly. So it helps it chip off extra edges and also sorts them by size, like I said, and it helps them grow a deeper cup. So the oysters, like some of them might like look like this, and then some of them might look like that. And the ones that are deeper have more meat, and that's what you want. And so once you're done and they're big enough, they're ready to harvest. So the picture on the left is actually a cage that has a bunch of biofowl all over it. I think this is definitely one of the grossest cages I've ever seen. It was literally like lower in the water. You could see it sitting lower because it weighed so much from the biofowl. And um, biofowl is basically anything you don't want growing um, with your shellfish. And they just take all the nutrients that you want to go towards your like oysters. And you don't want that because you want your oysters to grow, not like the mussels and gross whatever else is on that. <laughs> Um, so we spent time like scraping that off um, and we didn't get it perfect, but it was really gross to do, but very necessary. And we do that with all of the things we grow, especially when we also grow um, scallops and scallops get a lot more biofowl than oysters do. They all like, there's so many mussels stuck in like a chunk and they kill, um, our scallops a lot just because they take so much nutrients and just like glue onto them and so it's really important to get that off and then the middle picture is the oysters when we first pull them out of the ocean they're really really dirty and muddy those i think are some of the more like decent ones we've harvested jess is nodding over here uh, and then on the right are the ones that um we scrubbed clean um, I'm definitely kind of OCD about cleaning them. I scrub them to death because I like the way they look when they're clean. But Jess and Ken just kind of like brush off all of the like um, jingle shells and stuff stuck on them and call it a day. Um, and so one of my favorite, favorite things about going out with them is the community, um, of, like the aquaculture community. Um, I've heard stories about lobstermen cutting each other's lines and it's just like really competitive. But I feel like the shellfish industry, they're like really a team and they like to build each other up and help each other grow their business. So they actually started this co-op um, with a bunch of different farms and they're still working on growing it, but they just wanna share equipment and share knowledge. And I think that's amazing. And I wish that all communities were like that. So this is, I'm on the left and then another high schooler on the right and we are just working on setting up the space of the co-op. It's actually like a 20 foot container. Um, kind of an interesting space, but we make it work. And then on the right, we were helping our friends harvest some kelp, like the picture of me holding all that Here's kelp. the deal, whoever's at the back, what you see now. That looks like. Press six go in the bucket. And we harvested we should do a press 4,000 pounds of kelp that day which is insane we had these huge white bags that like came up like here on me and they were like this big filled with kelp and we had like six or eight of those it's here's the deal whoever's and then another thing we got to do was visit some other farm and see kind of their co-op or their space um and this was up in like Dan Scotta area so it was a hike there but it was definitely interesting to see their space but again i just love how open everyone is like sharing their knowledge and sharing how they do things to help other um, companies and businesses grow and this is my thank you to jess and ken for letting me join them out on the boat and teaching me everything i know and <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here with us. I will. <laughs> um, and they have some 
freshly harvested oysters, if anyone wants to try them. But they just sucked right in front of your eyes. Yeah. Can we have people ask you questions while the yeah. oysters? Yeah. Okay. So if you don't mind standing over there, I'll manage yeah. this one. Okay. Uh, there's so many wires. All right. Uh, thank you, Kimberly. So if anyone has any questions for Kimberly, um, you can ask them now. Zoom audience, you're missing a little ambiance here. Back there, there's uh, oysters being served to the to the live crowd. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. Oh. Okay, Emily's question for Kimberly was, what brought you to this uh, community and this internship? What, what was the interest? Um, so I actually, for like starting junior year, I was talking to a friend and I was like, I just don't know what to do for Black Friday. Like I want to do something that I don't know anything about and I want to become like an expert in that. And she just actually was um, my friend Ella's ultimate coach. And she was like, well, I know like these people that have like um, an oyster farm, maybe you could like do that. And so I got Jess's number and I texted her and was like, hey, is there any chance I could like be your intern? She was like, sure. And so like a couple days later, I just went out on the farm and I had no idea what to expect. And then it just all started from there. Wow, that was really a lot of initiative. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah. Matt um, asked her if she's going to keep doing this. I'm actually graduating this year, so I won't be able to continue it as my Flex Friday project. Um, but I definitely look forward on like summer break to be able to keep doing this. And um, I've also made a lot of connections through them, which is really great. And so I'll definitely stay in touch with the community and go out when I can. Awesome. Oh, Della. So Della asked if she ever gets sick of eating oysters. Um, honestly, I haven't had that many oysters. Usually I'm just there to help them sell them. Um, but at work, we actually sell oysters and I'll see a bunch of people eat them and I'll talk to them about it. So it's really like fun to be able to share my knowledge from the farm in a different place. Um, and oh, yeah, so oh, yeah, this is one of, wait, this is like near a jar. Yeah. Oh, don't worry about me. Um, one of the oysters that we have. Wow, do you know the anatomy of an oyster? Um, not a lot. Okay, yeah. Um, but I do know that there's a muscle under that you want to cut before someone eats it. Otherwise, they'll have a hard time like slurping it. Um, but yeah, so I that kind of being when they're it. shucking it. Yes. Yeah, so there, there's a top like layer, top um, layer of or a half of the shell over this, and then they take a little shucker knife and kind of get under that hinge. Oh, thank you. Like this, and they take the knife and they get under this hinge and open that up, and then they cut the muscle underneath and get it all pretty and ready to show and ready to serve. Okay. Oh, this is amazing. Thank you. Big round of applause. Super cool. Thank you, Kimberly. So while Kimberly is um, closing up shop, if you could provide her some feedback in the uh, form that's provided for you in the link. And those of us in the live audience, there's a QR code right there. If you would take just a couple minutes to provide some feedback, that'd be really great. I lost my program. Thank you so much. Okay. So our next presenters are going to be setting up, and it's Maggie Harms, Louisa Longshore, and Fraser Smith, and they did work with the Citizens Climate Lobby this year. You may remember back in the fall when we had a speaker bureau at the beginning of the year, Peter Dugas gave a presentation 
And these three students were intrigued and they designed their entire Flex Friday project around um, that, uh, that presentation was sort of the impetus for the project. I hope I didn't just steal the first slide of what was there. So, um, so I'm gonna, sh I'll, I'll share the screen. And this is an 18 minute presentation. Okay, so take it away, Citizens Climate Lobby. I hit present for you. Okay. okay. And yeah, if you just, if the, the Zoom audience appreciates it if they can see somebody. And then, yeah. So yeah, as Ms. King mentioned, um, my name's Maggie. I'm a ninth grader this year. Uh, my name is Fraser. I'm a ninth grader this year. And I am Louise Lunsko, and I'm a senior this year. So, just to kind of give you guys a little bit of background, so for our project this year, as Ms. King mentioned, we partnered with Citizens Climate Lobby, which is a nonprofit national organization that focuses on national policies to address climate change. So, specifically, the bill that we've been working with this year is called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Um, and throughout our project, um, we have also had the help of Peter Dugas, who is a volunteer from the Portland chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby. Some of you may have seen his presentation at the beginning of the year. All right, let's quickly just talk to our process of how we got to our project. We first saw Peter Dugas' presentation during the Real World Charts Not Speaker series, and we all were very inspired by it. So we started to learn and grow our knowledge and understanding of what this bill actually was because this presentation had so much information in it we were just kind of lost so we did a lot of research he was super great about answering all of our questions and meeting with us on wednesdays which was so useful for all of us then we used his slideshows and we started researching what all of the slides meant because he had so much information and we made our own slideshow from it we also added a couple of our own slides and we practiced the slideshow so much that we had it down we all had everything memorized we knew exactly how it worked and then we had to send emails and wanted to meet with people and share about this bill, but that was definitely the hardest part of our project. And we didn't fully meet our goals there, but we had a great, awesome time learning about the carbon dividend. And then we did some reflection during last week of school. So we want to share with you real quick. This is called En-ROADS, and it is an interactive climate simulation. So Again, some of you may have seen this from Peter's slideshow, but I'm just going to repeat that if you have. So looking at the, the graph on the left up here, um, this is just showing different sources of energy. And you can see down here, that's kind of the, the key for that. And then looking at the graph to the right, um, it is showing greenhouse gas net emissions and the black line is the baseline and um, the blue line um, you'll see that change as we move um, the sort of dials at the bottom here, um, but that would be the adjusted prediction. Um, and I also want you to look at the number that's in the upper right hand corner that says 3.6 degrees Celsius and you're going to see that change as we kind of change the scenario. So for example, looking at some of these, um, I'll just call them dials, I guess, at the bottom. Um, if you, for example, put some sort of bill in place, or for some reason we stopped using coal or substantially cut down on the coal that we're currently using. We can move this dial down. And if you look at both of these graphs, you see things shift. And you see the prediction, looking at the graph to the right, that's the prediction of how much carbon we'll be emitting. And you see that go down as, as that dial goes down. Um, and I'll try to get this link set out so that you guys can play around with this on your own if you want, um, because you can look at a lot of different things. If like, for example, you plant a lot of trees, afforestation goes all the way up here, you can see the blue line change and that going down. Um, and so I'm not gonna play around with this too much. 
you guys can do that on your own, but I want to take a moment for you to look at carbon price. Attention to what happens to that blue line and how much that changes. Um, so I'm just gonna start by going all the way up. That would be a very expensive carbon price or very high carbon price, I guess. But um, the bill that we're going to be talking about is probably is much lower than that, but it's still a substantial, um, substantial difference. Um, All right, and next thing we're just going to share the slides, some of our slides from our slide show, so that you guys can learn about the bill. Um, here in this slide, we have two maps. And this map over here shows the countries that pollute the most, and then this one shows the countries that have the most climate-related deaths over the past hundred years. And as you can see, countries that are wealthy pollute the most, countries that are not as wealthy have the most time rate of death. And to us, that really seems unfair. Okay. This slide shows how the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act will work. Uh, it will charge a fee on fossil fuels at the source, uh, where you get your oil, where they get the coal. The big companies will be taxed, and it will go to the government. And the government will give all the money back, 100% to the people as a monthly check. Okay, this slide shows uh, the amount of lives that are currently being lost due to air pollution every year, which is 114,000 lives every year. Just to make a big amount, way too many people are dying. And the amount of lives that could be saved because of better air quality, 400 thousand lives saved by better air quality by 2030. Not only could we save these lives, but over 12 years, we could cut our emissions by 40 percent. Um, all right, just going to do a recap of what Frazier just said. I like to think of it as if you go to the grocery store and you buy a glass container that has milk in it. You're going to pay a little extra because it's a glass container, but you can take that container back to the grocery store and get two dollars back. And so that's kind of how this has worked. There's going to be a price, there would be a price increase on carbon intensive products like gas and oil, but you would also receive a monthly check in the mail that gives back. So you would either be breaking even or gaining some money if you don't use as many carbon intensive products. And so I just want to elaborate a little bit on that too. So this slide is all about, um, about the dividend and kind of what that will look like. So the dividend will, or the bill as a whole, I guess, will end up benefiting low to middle income individuals or households. Um, you can see 80% of middle and low income households will benefit from this or won't, won't really be that affected by it. Um, and so the reason why this is, I wanna make this part clear, people aren't getting different amounts of money as their monthly check, depending on how much carbon they emit or how much money they earn or anything like that. Everybody gets an equal amount of money um, regardless of all of that. that. That amount might change from month to month or year to year, but it will be equal for everybody. So the reason why some people will benefit more than others is because of that gradual um, increase in carbon intensive products. So some people, people who use more carbon intensive products um, will end up paying a little bit more, even though they still get that dividend. Um, and the reason why low to middle income households will benefit is because on average, those households um, don't use as many carbon intensive products. Oh, and also you can just see that um, the annual dividend for a family of four with the 10th, in the 10th year of this bill being in place is approximated to be about $4,410. Um, so this slide, I just want to talk real quick about the cost of climate change. Um, so 2020 was the sixth consecutive year that the United States experienced 10 or more um, billion dollar weather and climate related disasters. Um, and that's compared to the 1980 through 2019 average of 6.6 .6 events per year. And to link it back to that other slide that I talked about, um, the impacts are often greatest among lower income communities, um, which are most likely to be more vulnerable um, to disasters through financial insecurity and more limited access to health care insurance. 
Okay, this slide shows the amount the fee will cost people and the amount returned as a dividend. Now the fee is the bar going up. The dividend is the green part. The amount returned is written in the green. And so what the cost is broken into three parts, our direct energy, which is our electricity, home heating, gas, and our indirect energy, which is when you make something and you use energy to create it, that's our indirect energy. And the whitish gray is our financial assets, which most people really don't have to worry all that much about. And so it's broken up into five quintiles, as you can see. Quintile one being people who are not so rich, and quintile five being people who are super rich. And so the rest is very obvious on the amount of returns and the amount of cost. Another look at who this would affect. So in the green graph, we have all house households. Um, as you can see, most people would benefit from this. And then it's broken up into um, the poor and the wealthy as it goes down. And you can see that poorer people would definitely benefit by this and lower income. And then higher income would not be as beneficial for them, but they already have a lot. And then we can look at the map of Maine. So it's a sliding scale. If you look at the top, dark red shows that 50% of the people in that area would benefit from it. And the purple shows 70% of the people would benefit of it. And Maine has quite a bit of purple as well as light red. So more than 50% of the people in Maine would be receiving a boost to their income during this. Okay, so this slide shows right here uh, the cost of climate change. We are paying 240 billion because of environmental and health damages due to fossil fuels and the burning of them. And we could be created 2.1 million new jobs, clean energy jobs, in 10 years if we put this bill in place. If we have many fossil fuels, we'll need the new energy. We'll be creating jobs. So that was that was sort of that was our slideshow about the bill. So we just want to take a second and sort of reflect about um, looking ahead and, and what this project was for us. So I, I think I speak for all of us when I say that we feel like we really learned a lot from this. We didn't quite meet with as many people as we wanted to, um, but we still really feel like we gained a lot from this. Like all of the things that you sort of ex expect to gain, I guess, but also like you know communication skills, teamwork skills, time management, organization, all of those sorts of things, we all really feel like um, our skills with that improved a lot. And also that it was really interesting to, this made us think about how there are so many different ways to approach climate change and think about solutions for climate change. Um, so this was an interesting sort of sneak peek at um, climate policy and um, it was really interesting to see all of the work that does go into trying to get a bill passed. Um, and thank you. All right. Thank you to everybody who's here. And also thank you to our leaders, Kathy and Julia, because they really supported us. And Mary King for having that speaker series, because that super helped us get our project going and to see you to support, because he answered a lot of our questions, spent a lot of time with us on Zoom. So thank you, everyone. I don't know if you noticed, I changed my mask. It says I want my carbon cash back. Um, so uh, are there any questions from the audience? And if you want to take the questions over there, I can manage the Zoom screen. I, I have one. Can you explain how receiving a carbon cash back would translate to creating um, new jobs? Okay. Like um, how does it how does it feed innovation and in green technologies? Okay, so because we are um, it will cost more money to use uh, our fossil fuels, and so companies, as we all know, are mostly about money. They want to make money. It'll be more efficient, and they'll get more money if they start using green technology instead of uh, the fossil fuels because of the amount they're being taxed. Oh. And so they'll have to have new jobs created. So it's incentivizing companies to yes. kind of turn their work to be a little bit more green. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah. 
The question is, where, where's the biggest pushback against this bill passing? That's a good question, and I honestly don't exactly know the answer to that. Um, I, yeah, I would imagine it'd be any of the companies that rely quite a bit on fossil fuels because they have to retain the car. They don't want to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And is the payback, um, it's it's gradual, right? So a company isn't the first year, it's, it's slow. It's, yeah, it builds up to get higher, but it starts really small. It starts small, so it doesn't really do much. Yeah. And the, um, the price on um, carbon products would start at 15 or $20 per metric ton, depending on a lot of other things, but that's kind of the approximate place where it would start, and over years it might become a little bit higher. And any other questions? I want to mention that the, um, the person who is in, in charge of uh, Citizens Climate Lobby Portland, some people reached out to me and they were so grateful for your work and they offered um, Maggie an internship next year. So that's on her plate that she can choose from and it's a huge honor. So thank you so much. I lost my script. Wait, so Declan and Emerson. It's innocent better than you think. Uh, yeah, I think that's the only one. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, it definitely will. So while we um, set up, you can take out the, um, the feedback form for those of you in the Zoom room. And for those of you in the live audience, you can use the QR code to give some feedback. And I will help. Okay. So I'm pleased to introduce you to Declan and Emerson. All right. Uh, I'm Declan. This is Emerson. Uh, I'm going to keep this brief because I think our work uh, kind of mostly speaks for itself. Um, I just want to quickly explain what we're actually going to show you. Um, so at the beginning of this year, uh, me and Emerson decided that we wanted to create a five-minute animated short film. Um, and about halfway through the year, while Emerson was animating, he had the idea that I could document this process. Uh, so that we would have two presentables at the end of the year, the film and the making of the film. We're about to show you the latter because we didn't actually end up completing our short film, um, but we learned some pretty valuable lessons about the creative process along the way, so we're going to show you that. Uh, it's about 15 minutes, so hopefully we'll have time for questions at the end. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you see it? Okay. Yep. Sorry, can we, uh, is there like speakers for the whole room? So we can be able to hear it. Don't care about no okay. guarantees. <laughs> um, it was, yeah, that's what you meant. Here we go. Right. Not it. <laughs> Where did it go? Okay. Switch it to the Epsom and then it'll come through here. Come up here. But yeah. will it play for the Zoom people? Uh, if you share the screen with the audio, it will. Okay. So now so I'm just going to go back to Zoom. Zoom.
and then I think it's on a it's on a different screen. Yeah. And then yeah. Okay. So it should be good. It should be good. Hey, Emerson. Hi. How's it going? Pretty good. Um, simultaneously on chat with uh, Red Giant support. Hey, you know what? But trying to figure out what is wrong with my my um, it's just something that I need to do to move me, and it's not working right. Are you recording me right now? Yeah. I'm recording you. Yeah, I need consent. Are you kidding me right now? Are you sure May is the state where you think is an I'm not hearing my camera on, so No, you should. You should. I definitely need to clean the community as well. Okay, but no? Fine, fine, fine. No. But, uh, but um, I appreciate it. Yeah, but we're, um, just give me a second. I look like but poop, okay? Yeah, I take back the documentation idea because I have no idea why I why I think it's too late. This is so hard. This is too hard. So I guess the idea of the project came about. Um I kind of wanted to, and I was gonna agree, but I kind of wanted to create a story about that involved for a team just because that was what everyone was experiencing. So it was a kind of a unifying idea. What played a role in what both Emerson and I had experienced in working was sort of isolation. Uh, so we wanted to write a story that sort of encompassed both of those things. Uh, and an astronaut stranded in space sort of the very easily fit the criteria of that. We had to work from home. You know, we wanted to limit them like I'm out of contact and so um, I feel like we are going to be able to do animation completely online um, and we started off wanting to do just two basic drawing animation but um, as we looked more into it and you know thought about our idea um, we realized it was going to be possible to to do um, 3D animation. My role is well, I, I wrote the script initially. Um, now I'm working on this project, which is essentially documenting the process as we go along. And I'll also be working on audio uh, a little bit later. I don't think when that's going to be at this point. It's whenever uh, Emerson has the individual clips that he said he's ready to um, begin adding, adding sound to. My role in, in the movie um, is um, basically to just make our visions come to life. We, we commissioned um, a lot of the 3D objects in the film, um, but just messing around and, and customizing them to fit out our needs, animate the astronaut and, um, you know, everything in between. I, I've never done any animating um, previous to um, us coming up with this idea. I think people highly underestimate the amount of work this stuff takes even just the amount of work leading up to actually starting to animate when it comes to like organizing the furniture in the actual interior of the spaceship the textures and um the lighting um and you know figuring out why things aren't working um it it, it can take anywhere from you know a couple of days to a week or two to just finish one shot and get it to a place where um, it's really finished. But right now we are moving into the main animation phase. So um, we have the intro shots done, um, sort of showing the exterior of the spaceship. Now we're moving into starting to um, individually move the pieces of the astronaut and use preset um, motion capture data from uh, real people actually moving. Um, and, and combine them um, to make the movements that we need. Just running out of time is is my main fear, um, and I think I think we are on.
on schedule than we've been, been uh, ahead of schedule many times. So uh, it's going well. The other thing I worry about was just like whether or not we would be able to get uh, the animation to look good. Um, and from the clips that you sent me, uh, I think it looks pretty good. So in previous years, we've struggled a lot um, with workload and scheduling and giving us giving ourselves too much to do in too little time. I feel like both to to sort of both of us being kind of disappointed in the way last year's project turned out and the fact that you're just forced just get by the nature of the way school is being done this year to learn new ways to do things. I think we've done a much better job this year at, at uh, uh, creating ways to actually complete the work this year after. The first question, pretty simple. Um, what's progress been like, or what's been going on in the project since our last meeting? Progress has been pretty slow. Um, as of recently, um, really due to um, lack of motivation on my part. Um, getting, you know, the the end of, like I, I'm struggling with schoolwork, um, and so kind of trying to manage, um, you know, this huge project and schoolwork at the same time uh, proves to be a little difficult. So we are um, on track to have a little bit of work done, but uh, I don't think it's something that we're going to get done better. We had a you know a big sense of confidence because we've been we've been in this position before um and we kind of knew how to avoid it uh and you know, at least we thought just not giving in and like just having maybe a little bit more of a a, a structure in, in how work gets done in projects like these um so maybe a set amount of time every day every week or even every day um just kind of sit down and, and work on big things like this um you know time management is really important i think that's a big time i think generally just what i have been thinking about is just you know just the early, I, I feel like i learn this lesson every year but like this kind of stuff happens on projects um things take more time and, People have personal lives, and you know, there are issues that, you know, lots of things go awry, and you think that each year is going to be different, but then, you know, you run into a lot of same problems, and it feels like, you know, you're learning a lesson all over again. And right. In my, yeah, exactly. And my hope is that um, over time, uh, after making more projects in the future, I hope that uh, I will um, not be as. Uh, surprised or upset and just to anticipate and prepare. One thing I'll add is that this was going to be uh, sort of a, a side project kind of thing, what we're doing right now. Um, now it's looking more like this will be eventually the main thing we present towards the end of the year. The idea was always to, you know, document the process of what was happening, but it was never, this was never the idea to be the main thing we present. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how this goes over. I think it was a great backup plan, honestly. Um, just to show kind of what we went through and, you know, document all the work that we did do um, and how far we actually did come. We, we had a really great idea this year, and, and I think it's going to continue to be the idea, in, you know, in, in the next couple of years or in the next year or two. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay. And this would be like, okay. <laughs> when you learn about that? Um, 
So this is basically just going to be a summarizing and maybe our final thoughts before our presentation. Um, so, yeah, sure. Whoa. <laughs> I thought you were like, show. I don't know what I thought you <laughs> This is great. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> are we doing <laughs> so? Uh, think about what you can compare or what you want at the beginning of the year to what we have done now. Uh, how do you feel about um, the goals we set initially and where we are now? I think the goals were a little bit ambitious. I am so proud of where we got and how far how far we did get this year. And I think our presented goals are going to still be as impressive as if we were, as if we accomplished all the goals we, we hoped to. How are you feeling about presenting this, uh, about what we've chosen to present? Uh, I'm excited. Yeah, I, I don't have any worries or anything like that. I think what we did this year is pretty is really impressive, especially for the situation we've been in, just not being able to be in school or in a in a setting like that and just doing everything completely from home. Yeah, and we also dedicated a lot of our, our free time into this project too. Um, not just Wednesdays. Um, and I, I think that definitely shows. This year I think I learned a lot about um, content wise. I learned a lot about um, like 3D animation and using the programs uh, that I've been so interested in the past couple of years and, and taking them to their fullest extent and pushing them to their limits. Um, and I also think I learned a lot about what I want to do um, in my future. I had a, a lot of fun with this project and it, it really inspired me to maybe want to go to school or something like this. I think I'm not going to give up give up on this project. I think I'm going to continue to work on it um, and get it to a, a very polished point um, and really like push the project to the, the state where we were hoping to get it at the end of this year. I'm really excited to get this finished and get it done. Um, it's just going to take a long time. In a lot of ways, I think we accomplished more than we thought we could. Like, you know, you mentioned this, we thought we were going to do simple 2D animations. And you've been able to crack, you've been able to crack some of this like really cool, I mean, all these really cool 3D animations that look great. And so I think it's just been really impressive um, to see you craft. Uh, you said this at one point we were talking like craft something out of nothing. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, we're testing things out. All right. Uh, I think that's it for me. Do you have any final thoughts? Um, yeah, I just, um, like I said before, I just, I think we've, we've come really far. Um, um, and yeah, <laughs> I don't want to ask anything. All right. I think that's it. Okay. You know that Michael got away with the most successful job in payment plan or growth plan. The most important one was the doctor's affordable electronic firewall, and the game that generates an electrical job power enough to come through scale and concrete like a bolt of light. I
So I use. Sorry, the question was, what software did you use to create the animations and had you had any experience doing that before? Um, I used uh, Cinema 4D to animate the astronaut um, and his movements, and I had no experience with that. Um, to combine everything, um, to make the reflections, and the, the most work was in After Effects, and I had lots of experience with After Effects. Um, so that, that helped a lot, um, having that past experience. Other questions? So the, Rebecca asked the question and made the observation that they were kind of trying to capture the experience of isolation and that that they really did do that. And then additionally, what were any other experiences they were trying to capture? Uh, the big one for me was routine. So one thing I felt like in quarantine was I felt like I was doing the same things over and over again. So I definitely wanted to, when I was writing, I wanted to capture uh, that idea just in what we did throughout the day. Um, if we'd gotten to animate more, there's a scene in which uh, it's sort of, there's a lot of cuts and it sort of he's going through the same thing over and over again every day. Um, so that would be the main thing. Do you have anything? Yeah, I think um, one of the things is sitting down, um, <laughs> animating the, the astronaut um, with his feet up on the um, on the table is exactly how I sit, like all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, and I agree, routine, um, doing the same thing. Yeah. Any other question from the audience? Yeah. Justin, who was their um, cluster leader, acknowledged just how, I, I can't say it as eloquently as he did, but how they really overcame these obstacles and they worked with what they had in a really, really um, potent way. Any other questions? Oh, Tyler, what's the time? Oh, we're done. Okay. All right. Um, Thank you so much. Okay, so please take a minute to provide some feedback to our presenters. The um, link is in the chat and for the live audience, you can take out your phone and use the, um, the QR code. Grace. Hi, Grace, it's good to see you. Um, I'll share the screen. And Grace, your presentation is 20, 18 minutes, right? So. Okay. Uh, Okay, so Grace McLellan is going to share her work creating a graphic novel on climate change. So take it away, Grace. Am I in the camera? Am I good? Stand with you. <laughs> yeah, um, you can see if you can stay here. Does this work? It's cool. Okay. <laughs> Well, hi everyone. Um, I'm Grace. I'm a junior here at Baxter. It's actually my first year here. Um, also my first Flex Friday project. Um, 
and you know I'm going to talk about my graphic novel um, discussing climate change. Is it like this? Okay. Um, so yeah, my um, project uh, aims to address climate change by providing useful and thought-provoking facts in an art form that is both engaging and inspiring. Um, I have background knowledge in art. I've been doing it for a long time now. So I was really hoping that like if I combined, you know, my um, passion to talk about, you know, issues regarding climate change and things um, like that, that I would be able to incorporate my art and that would help persuade, you know, people to consider participating in the protection of our earth. Um, so what was the process? Um, I'm not going to lie, it was really difficult, um, mainly just because, uh, like in the last presentation, um, I think I said that the buildup, you know, to getting to where you actually have all the information to uh, illustrate and, you know, create that final product, you really need to do um, so much research and really, you know, dig deep and find all the right information you need to complete it. Um, so I started with the research. Um, and here's just kind of like a little snippet of uh, my notes and how I started to organize it. Um, the layout itself, I was kind of trying to uh, keep it organized enough so when it did come time to start to illustrate everything, I would have all my notes organized correctly so I could um, just translate the information I collected, the main bullet points into my art. Um, so you can kind of see I started with this history of climate change and pick the main points I wanted to talk about. Um, and then here, oops, sorry, there is uh, the next page. You can kind of see I then moved on to the introduction. You know, I wanted to talk about what is climate change, define it, same idea, just wanted to keep it, you know, straight to the point and um, enough information that I could illustrate, you know, to it, but also not too much that the text would just be taking up the whole page of what I wanted to also, you know, um, add my notes to. And you can see that I also uh, started to list some effects, but later on, I decided that there was more information that I wanted to talk about before that. So you'll see that in my art too. Um, and then this is just an example of uh, one of the sources that I used. Um, this particular snippet is from NASA's official website, just talking about um, changes in precipitation patterns and how that's related to climate change. Um, and, you know, it's kind of just another example of like, you know, finding good resources. NASA is generally considered an unbiased, you know, totally factual site and um, just trustworthy. So there's lots to look into when you're finding, you know, all that information. Um, then came the art portion. And, you know, besides like uh, gathering all the information, which is difficult a lot because um, there are so many um, sites and opinions that are mainly biased. And, you know, when it comes to climate change, I think it's generally a pretty controversial topic. So when you're looking for um, all that information to then display, you know, and for other people, it's um, really important to make sure that you have that all correct. So I think. You know, that's what slowed me down the most this year was um, just making sure I had all the facts that I was you know, going to be giving other people. <laughs> but um, when it came to the art, I, um, I've been doing digital art for a while now. I make a lot of, you know, graphic designs. I do commissions. I, you know, it's, art's been a big part of my life for, you know, ever. <laughs> and um, uh, Procreate is an app program that I have used for a long time. I'm familiar with it, um, the style of the app and just, you know, how to use it. I've taught myself how to um, navigate it. and I was really comfortable with it and it ended up working really well for this project. Um, and then this image contains some of the uh, original concept art for the narrator of the novel. Um, when I started the project, I knew that um, I definitely wanted some sort of character that would kind of be there to lead the reader along as we go through and you know talk about all these kind of 
stressful topics. Um, so I started with a human character that I thought would be uh, good to keep that human connection and to keep people engaged and you know just interested in following like this little person <laughs> along through the story. Um, and then this was the first sketch I made. Um, I always start with a uh, bright pink kind of sketch layer first. That's usually how I uh, jot down my ideas and I write notes. And I, um, you know, just kind of get all of my thoughts down in a messy version first. Um, I actually, I learned later on that this format would not work, but, um, you know, it kind of got me started to think about how I wanted to begin the actual illustration portion of this project. Um, the second test page of the novel uh, kind of shows what I do next. I um, take the pink layer and I go over it with the final line art, which is always like a darker color, you know, just finalize it, make it crisp and clean. And then I um, tried to kind of figure out how I wanted to organize the panels because I was really trying to go for that comic style look, um, something that was, you know, cool for all groups. And um, I know you can see here, I kind of tried to like uh, figure out how I wanted to put these like info bubbles and text bubbles and things just to organize it so it's easy to read and you know, not too much at once. Um, and then this is the final version of the narrator that I stuck with. Um, you know, she's just a quirky gal who's there to, <laughs> you know, lead you along and it's, this project's been really good for me to practice anatomy because I would not have tried otherwise. But um, so the web format was kind of like how I started to think about um, how I wanted to publish this project, you know, in a way that is easily accessible for everyone. And when I started um, at the very beginning of the year, when I was thinking about how I wanted to do this project. Um, I, I was really hoping that I would be able to produce a actual um, printed, you know, copy, like an actual book, but uh, that turned out to be um, too much money and I don't have that much time. So um, I, and I also figured, you know, most everything is online nowadays anyways, and that makes it um, easier to find and share and just a lot better, so. Um, so I ended up choosing to use the app Webtoon, which is a webcomic app. It is home to um, creator-owned uh, short stories, um, you know, graphic novels like mine, uh, manga, um, comic strips, just anything you can think of. And, um, and you know, you can uh, navigate through it really easily. It's um, super accessible. You can use it on any type of device, tablets, computers, it's all, it's just an easy downloadable, you know, app and website. Um, you can sort through all sorts of genres, you know, it's not just informational stuff like mine, you can find all sorts of things. And um, it's just a really good site for artists like me who want to have control over their art and what they're publishing, you know, it's not controlled by a um, bigger company that will you know, could censor or whatever, but it's it's just a good okay. Um, and then this is just kind of like this has changed a bit, but this was my original dashboard. This is what it looked like. Um, you can see like I have my title and this is my tag, and it shows what genre it is under. Um, uh, this was when I had the first episode uploaded. Um, each kind of chapter is uploaded like an episode and you can um, flip through them. It's really easy and fun. But um, yeah, so uh, it's easy for me to upload and um, super uh, easy to, you know, just to navigate, like I said, but. And it's also, um, you know, very interactive, very much kind of like a social media app, but it kind of, you know, it incorporates the fact that it's, um, there to help artists, you know, share their work in a friendly and inclusive way. Um, you can subscribe to follow my story. Um, it tells me how many people have seen it. Um, you can rate it, you can share it. It's just a 
all the kind of things that you find on like any other website or app. So super fun. And then see if that works. Okay, so this is what the website looks like. Um, I will show you the first episode just to give you kind of a sneak peek as to what it kind of looks like. Um, so this is what I meant by the format change. It was instead for Webtoon, it's very long. It slides like this. So when you're looking at your phone, it kind of moves along like, you know, sort of like you're scrolling through Instagram or something. And um, yeah, so that you can see my style is not consistent whatsoever, but. <laughs> So yeah, that is that. It's very different. And you know, that's what that looks like. But, you know, in conclusion, um, it's not finished, but I plan on, you know, continuing to work on it for the rest of the summer. I think now that I have more time outside of school, it'll give me an opportunity to um, try to actually complete it. And, you know, even if it's not fully complete, I'll just try to keep adding on more information the more I learn. Um, it was a great learning experience, you know, for me to figure out what it's like to balance, you know, schoolwork and a major project and, um, you know, uh, I want to thank like my Flex Friday cluster group and everything. Like, it was really, it was just a great experience for me just to um, use my art in a way that is actually hopefully going to be impactful and I get to share with, you know, a group of people that I think will really appreciate it. So, yes, thank you. <laughs> That's really amazing. Um, thank you, Grace. Can does anyone in the audience have any questions? Stella. So Della asked Grace, when making pages, how long does it take to make any given page or chapter a sense of the timeline? Um, well, you know, it's kind of it's me at first just because I had to, you know, figure out how the format worked, how it was going to be uploaded onto the actual website. I guess Webtoon chops it up so you can actually in different pieces and it uploads all as one. But um, that first episode took me, I think, two days um, mainly, which doesn't seem like a long time, I think, just because of how often, you know, like illustrations like that can take a long, you know, animation can do it can take a long time. But um, once I started to, you know, get into it, it just got easier. So that second episode two that I have up only took me like, I think four hours, but you know, it just gets faster when you, you know, get into it, so. Yeah. Um, How many episodes are you planning to make? Um, I kind of want to keep that like open-ended just because I think there's so much information out there that I can't include that if I don't give myself an end date or like a number of chapters that it'll actually encourage me more to keep working on it. So yeah. Yes. I can't, is it close? Say that a little louder. Finding my. Oh, oh. What, what did she use to turn her illustrations digital, and what was that process like? Um. Well, you know, I rarely ever do analog drawings like on paper. So, um, that Procreate app that I was talking about is actually just like a sketch pad on my like my iPad, and I use an Apple pencil, and I just, you know, you can choose the size of your canvas, and I just go from there. It's really easy. It's funny. Okay. Question. Do 
Gretchen. Gretchen's asking if this project will continue into next year or what are the thoughts? Um, you know, I have thought about that and I, I think that would be cool, but I also want to try if I can to kind of like also do another project, something similar, but maybe addressing like a different topic and do like a series, just like of my art talking about issues that we have going on right now. I think that'd be really cool to try. So yeah. Time, Tyler. Cool. Any other questions? Rebecca. Mm. Good question. The question was, are there graphic artists that you admire or that have inspired your style? Um, actually, not any like uh, mainstream artists. I have a lot of like online artist friends who do the same thing, and they actually were the ones who suggested I use webtoons because they use it themselves. And I think that's you know also just like a perfect way for me to you know um, kind of for like uh, just get people just let people know that webtoon is out there because it is such a cool environment of just all sorts of small creators that are using it to you know show their art and otherwise you never know about it kind of you know so yeah mm. thank you so much. And also, Grace, welcome to Baxter. This is your first year. I didn't know that. Um, okay. Last but not least, Quentin. Are you Quentin? Okay. Quentin May is gonna um, is gonna share his impressive project with us. But while Quentin's getting set, please do give Grace some feedback using the QR code or the link that's been provided in the chat. Thanks, Emily. Hi, Quentin. Hi. So. Uh, Do you have my Yep, I have your slides. And oh, this is but now well. I think it's I meant to change that. Not um and, and all you do is go like this to go to the next slide. What first? You, you just you just hit this and it'll go yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so not my two compositions, but you can see just right there on the screen. For the audio for that. Yeah, yeah. That'll, that'll work out great. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right, <laughs> everyone, I'm really pleased to introduce. Is there anything? Oh, good point. You're great right on it. You'd think, I, you'd think I would have got that, yeah. <laughs> By now, this is the 24th presentation. This kid, come on! All right, so I'm happy to introduce Quentin May. All right, hi. I'm, as she said, Quentin. I'm just this year. I decided to take on the project of writing music for small ensembles. So, like, you know, groups of just a couple instruments. You know, traditionally three to four or five. You can get all sorts of different kinds. And I felt like that was the thing that I, I felt drawn to this year after a lot of thinking. <laughs> oh. oh, clicking. All right, there we go. All right. So during this year, my main goal at the beginning was to put together either two or three small ensemble composition. I wasn't totally sure about um, the timeline of it of it because I hadn't really taken on a project like this before. So I hadn't like really sat down and just like written stuff out at this degree. I'd done like little things here and there, but never full full out compositions. And I chose this project because when COVID hit this what well, last year actually, um, the music industry was hit pretty hard and their music was kind of killed out for a few months, a few solid months. There really wasn't much coming out and I wanted to try to put more into the world to like try to help boost it back to where we had been going before. And one thing that was tough during this project was high management because like I said, I had never taken on a project like this. And I had, I didn't really know what really went into it. So 
there was definitely some setbacks of like um, just not knowing where to go next. But I still I I pushed through that and I I put together a sax quartet and a string quartet. So during while this project was going on, it was it was definitely tough to fight through some low levels of motivation, especially in like the middle of the year and like the second third of the year, just because it was it felt like the year was just dragging on. I just it was hard to find it in myself to just keep doing stuff. But you know, once I managed to find find it in myself to keep writing through that, I I made the two compositions that I feel pretty proud of them in making, which hasn't always been the case with what I do, but these two I feel pretty proud about. So. And if I were if I were to go back and do this project again or to continue this project, I definitely would want to like at the beginning really sit down and get some long term planning because that's that's always a project that's always a problem with every project. You never really it's always hard to figure out how long everything's going to take. And I think really taking some time on that would be a very important step if I were to do this next year. And if I were to continue this project next year, I think my next big step would be to try to write for a real ensemble. So not just some robot on the computer. I'd write for like, you know, I'm a part of a jazz quartet. And one thing that I could do is write music for us because I know what each one of us is capable of doing. And so it, it, I think it more opens up the possibilities of what I can do because the robots, I kind of just like do the things that I can, I can think of, but knowing the people, it really, I, I know what they've been able to accomplish and what they can do. And so I'd be able to use that to like really expand on what I'm writing make some really, really interesting things, I think. And before before we go on, I want I really want to thank everyone that's helped me with the music, especially Dustin, who is here right now, and Jordan, who isn't, but you two have really helped a lot. You know, the classes have taken and just all the work online and after school and all that. It was really helpful to get some good good stuff. So before I go on to my compositions, does anyone have any space questions? Oh, Stella, yeah. Yeah, so I, I use a program, a free program called MuseScore. It's a, it's a good, good program. You can just download it online. It has a bajillion instruments and all, you can write basically most of what you want to do. There are some limitations, but it's kind of hard to hit those. Emily? I, I do play instruments. I play um, a couple mainly. I play saxophone, a couple of those saxophones. I play some percussion instruments like um, marching percussion instruments, like snare drum and a bass drum, and also. Um, drum kit I'm learning currently. And that's what I actually play in our jazz quartet. I'm the drummer because we needed a drummer. <laughs> yeah, those are those are the main ones that I do. Um currently it's all robots, but if I were to do this over the summer, I think I would do a live recording of my sax quartet. Because I've done I've done that kind of thing before where I take like a composition that's already done, and I'll record all the parts go for it and put it all out. Yeah, any more before we move on? Huh? All right. So, right here, I have my sax quartet called Out Into the World. Set the sound up first. Okay, yeah. Oh, 
Hold on. Always a strawberry. Yeah, it really is. Technical difficulties. Yeah. To the projector, yep. It didn't like it very much. Is this connected to the that's not on, no, so I was getting some feedback, but you could. Do you know where those speakers go that go back there? Those? I don't know why it worked for the other two. I don't know why either. Here's a little thing right here. Yeah, they can hear just on the same call, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They yeah. Can. Spoil it, you know. <laughs> I know that's exciting. I know. Notes that we've gotten so far. <laughs> Just little hints of what it might be. Yeah. <laughs> While we wait, we do have a question in the chat. Uh, Eric asks, Quentin, did you compose more horizontally, melodically, or vertically, harmonically? Uh, I'd say to start out, I started more horizontally. I create melodies and decide how I. Yeah, um, you're going to have to correct me. I might get some of this wrong. Um, the horizontally composing is more like you write out stuff. It's you know kind of how it looks when you're doing it. You write out single lines, and then you you build off of those single lines. And more vertical writing is like starting out with something, and then you know getting a structure built, and then building melodic and harmonic lines off of those. That about hit that. Yeah, and I think for the most part, I started out writing horizontally. I'd write out some melodies. And I'd kind of have ideas of what I'd want to do for the harmony, but it really happened as I was writing the line. So. Perfect. We'll this, start. Can, this can control the volume for you. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll start with the sax quartet called Out Into the World.
So does anyone have any questions about that composition? Emily? I'm curious if you have like an inspiration for it, like if you like this for a movie or a video game or any mass closure, like what would you Um, I think for like playing it you could I think this would be more of like a concert type thing. And like while I was writing I was thinking about like uh the isolation of the pandemic and like that's kind of where the name comes from it's being isolated and then coming back into a, a new and different world and yeah yep yeah anything else before we move on yes in the zoom eric asks are the alto and baritone lines supposed to be in different key signatures um what part eric can you clarify which part okay second and fourth lines um oh yeah i see what you mean like right here um When I when I was writing this, I was writing it because MuseScore has a feature where you can just turn it all into concert keys, so you can look and like look down the line and see chord structures. Because when it's like this, it's a lot harder because they're they're in different keys. So, but I think when I flipped it back into oh, the original keys of the instruments, it kind of just messed with the, the signature. So, if I were to give this out to real people to play, I'd like go back and add some like I'd, I'd change some of that stuff up so it would make more sense to the to the players. Cool. All right. We'll move on. Nope. Don't play. Ah. No. Not this is the arrow. So <laughs> this is my string quartet that I wrote and I, it is named the porcelain world.
questions. Julia. What are the instruments in your home? So top to bottom, we've got a violin, violin one, and you've got another violin, violin two. We have a viola and a cello. Emily. Eric in the chat said that violas loved it, that they were such a nice line. Yeah, yeah I, that's one thing I, I, I know. I, I'm not a string player, but I know violas are always you know, put in the corner. I, I wanted to give them something. I was like, here, have a solo. I know you don't get those very often, so have it. This is your one shot. <laughs> yeah. Okay, any other questions? Uh, strings? No. I'm terrible at any instrument that has strings. Um, it's a lot in the beginning process of writing. I like go on YouTube and I just watch a bunch of different compositions. What I did with the sax quartet and the string one, I would just go on YouTube and just like watch and listen, take notes and see like what what kind of things they were doing and what what really gave that style its its feeling behind it. Justin. Um, well, like I said, with the sax quartet, I had the inspiration of um, the isolation of the pandemic and coming into the world. And this one, it didn't have as much. I, I'm more just, I had some sounds in my head that I had gotten from listening to all the string quartets, and I kind of just wrote, wrote them out. You have a message or a question in the chat from Simeon Pillsbury. He says, which one did you compose first? Um, I did the sax quartet first. I, I started with that. And then once I was completed with that, I, I started the process on the string quartet. Yeah. So I think you said earlier in the process that if you could go back, you would do different time management. Yes. But I will say I'm pretty impressed with what you have done. Um, what would that have looked like, um, different time management for you? Because you were successful in creating something pretty amazing. I'm wondering what, what better time management would look like. Um, I think I would have had, like, I think I would have actually made, like, a calendar and, like, really given myself the dates to eat because that's one thing that I can do to myself. I can see something that has to be done by, you know, the end of the year. And there are these kind of like mini goals that are, you know, about this time. I think if I were to redo it, I would definitely want to go through and get like a little mini calendar and write out like specific days or weeks where I want stuff to be done. And I think that would that would help me along the process. That is great wisdom for the entire audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's time yeah. management is extremely important yeah. in every Flex Friday process. Absolutely. Every time Absolutely. you every time you relearn that it's very important. Yes. Yeah. 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 And the last question. Well, I just have one question. Yeah. Are you I'm a junior. I'll be here next year. So music is really gonna be a good strength. Really talented. Possibly, yeah. 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 Well they haven't graduated yet. Yeah. Sunday I can. <laughs> Thank you. Do take a minute to provide some feedback for Quentin and to the um, Zoom audience. Thank you so much into the live audience, especially the presenters, to be vulnerable like this in front of your peers and to share your experience, to share your process is really, really meaningful. So thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, okay, there is one more question. One more question. Um, Logan said, I love your work, and I'm just curious, during the first piece, I noticed that different saxes were playing in different keys and weren't superimposed. Was there a reason? Yeah, I think Eric had a similar question with like the alto and Barry being in different keys. It's just because of how uh, music work has their systems and how I was writing it, with all of them being in the same key. And then when it 
which is that means they're original to me. It kind of does some funky things unless I like go through and I go on each line and like switch all the signs up and make it different. It kind of it, it, it messes with things, but yeah, they they are they're like. Oh, there's another. Let's hear yes, it. yes, we do have another question from Miles Huntley. Wonders: Is there any reason they have similar titles about a world? Um. So with the the first one, the name came from like coming out into the world after being isolated from the pandemic and how that is. And the second one, um, I was getting some ideas because I'm terrible of stuff so i was asking around for ideas and names and my girlfriend said that when she heard it she thought of like a bunch of different porcelain figures like porcelain frogs and like houses and stuff so i i just decided to kind of lump it all together with the porcelain world and one more <laughs> noah fowler wants to know if you tried any playing any of the pieces yourself with your instruments I did. I tried playing the back quartet a little bit, and I might do a full recording of it. And there are some parts that they look easier on the paper when you when you're playing it. Takes takes some more air support, especially in like the second section of it where it speeds up. But yeah, yeah. Awesome. I, I'm never gonna touch the, the string quartet. I suck. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, Thank you. Audience, you're welcome. We're going to report to our um, advisories at 1.15 to process all that we have seen. Thank you. I'm going to end this.